Frazier? Here. Ms. Jordan? Here. Mr. Lamb? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Ms. Seymour? Here. You have seven members present. Are you here? Uh, Madam President, uh, before we start the meeting, I would like to uh, amend the agenda by adding one more item, mm -hmm. and uh, we can add it wherever you feel it's appropriate. But it's uh, a letter that we received just recently about the fireworks and the legislative legislatives are going to yeah. reconsider it. So I'd like to talk about that. I don't. I never received that letter. No, I didn't. Uh, well, we didn't all get it. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll put it in there. Um, probably. I'll put it in there. Okay. All right. Um, Madam President, the first item on your agenda is a liquor license application from Car Deal Incorporated, um, doing business as the Economy American Bistro. The attorney, Mr. Carlin, is here with his uh, clients this evening to answer any questions you may have. Uh, on that new uh, 
um, at that time. Um, and we were uh, treated to um, samples of the food in the lobby. Um, uh, it was delicious. Um, and personally, I'm glad to see um, that space get uh, new life. And, um, and it goes hand in hand with the other improvements that have been made at that office building. Uh, some significant money has been put into, um, <coughs> it's a great building, but they have um, changed those yeah, well, uh, done improvements on the site as well as in the building, and I believe they added a gym for office yeah. workers and a number of other things, uh, amenities to the building. So uh, this would complement um, uh, what they're trying to do over there, and uh, I was very pleased uh, with what I saw. Madam Chairman, uh, can I ask they need uh, immediate action and you have to hurry for the license? Yes, yeah, sure. you would be doing us a great favor by uh, Rule 10. Uh, <laughs> we're waiting to get this thing open and we need this to get up there as quickly as possible. Mr. Friedman, his hand up. Well, you well, well, no. please? I do, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just want to move on real fast. Oh. Uh, reading through the material, it says that you haven't decided on what the hours are. Uh, have you decided? I mean, what the paperwork was done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we yeah. have now. Lunch is 11 to 2.30. Yes. Uh, we'll do a light service from 2.30 to 4, or 2.30 to 5, I'm sorry, and full dinner service uh, from 5 to 10. And that will be Monday through Friday, and then Saturday will be open for dinner only. And on Sunday? Uh, Sunday, as of right now, we will um, not be opening with the exception of special holidays, Mother's Day, Easter, um, and uh, the consumer demand says we need to be open on a Sunday, we'll definitely look That's good, it. because you're asking for for extra hours in the, in the paperwork. For the Sunday sales? Yes. Uh, before, move food before noon, and then late hours? Correct. Just uh, Okay. And just in case. Okay. And <coughs> this is just a curiosity question, uh, Mr. Dixon. This is, it says that uh, in your paperwork you said you lived in Michigan your whole life, yeah. except you were born in Stuttgart, Germany. I was. Uh, how long did you live in Germany? One year. One was, year? I was an Army brat. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. It's just curious. <laughs> yeah, both, both my parents grew up in Michigan, actually, but my dad was uh, actually a captain. Okay. Your, mother, <coughs> your, came from, your wife came from Grand Rapids. No. Um, my wife came. Yeah, how yeah you boy, you've done your homework. Even I forgot. Don't tell her. That's not on the record. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh, it's not on the record that he forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what 35 years of marriage will do you. You forget those. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is. Um, Mark, did you have something? I don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, yes, you have a little pen, please. Um, Aye. Madam Chair, I move that the liquor license be present for the other to be approved.
to gain hands-on experience in exploring how survey technology shaped our geographic, social, and economic landscapes, and to connect with communities across the baseline. And I'm going to allow Mr. Barr um, to give you a little more detail, but um, I just wanted to show briefly that three of them have already been installed along 8 Mile. The first one was done in Northville, Michigan. The second one was done in Farmington Hills at Founders Park. And the third one, most recently in the fall, was done in Novi at Community Sports Park. And the, the Boy Scout there gives you a, a sense of scale. These obelisks are roughly 10 feet tall. Mr. Barr is an artist who lives in Novi, but is known throughout the world. His work is displayed at Park Plaza in Detroit, in front of the Michigan Historical Museum in Lansing, at Bishop Airport in Flint, in front of Chrysler's European headquarters in Brussels and elsewhere. Mr. Barr also created Michigan Legacy Art Park on the grounds of Crystal Mountain in Thompsonville, Michigan. The park is intended to bring art to northern Michigan communities that do not have the same access to art that is available to those living in more urban environments. Mr. Barr developed the Coasting the Baseline Obelisk Project and donates all of his time and artistic expertise to the communities involved. Again, as uh, Mr. Barr can get into this in a little bit more detail, but in the 1830s when Thomas Jefferson um, required that the Midwestern uh, Territory be surveyed, all, um, all townships were based on the baseline that runs east-west and then prime meridian north-south. Our township, Southfield, is a six by six square township or comprising roughly 36 square miles. Every township is based off of that grid. So tonight he's here to present the concept, to talk a little bit about engaging the community here in Southfield, and then after his presentation, I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have. We have one tentative site <coughs> along 8 Mile and Rutland that the city currently owns. We would need approximately a 10 by 10 square foot easement area in order to construct that. This is a nine month, 12 month process. But without any further ado, I'll, I'll introduce Mr. Barr and have him come up, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Okay. And I have some of your photos up here. I'll okay. go through them. Okay. 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 First of all, thank you for having me here. My name is David Barr, B A R R. I have 22600 Napier in Novi. I've been out there for 32 years. Before that, I lived in Oak Park. Before that, I lived on the east side. I've always lived within a mile, of eight miles, as it turns out. Curious. <laughs> no big plan to that or significance. Um, I'm an artist and a teacher and uh, a writer. And I've always donated about 20% of my time to nonprofit projects schools, education, and communities trying to bring the arts into the communities and support them. This is a entirely a nonprofit project. Um, I'll probably try to tell you just a tiny bit of the history of surveying, which sounds pretty dry, but I think it's actually uh, can be seen in a way that's kind of exciting. So if you'll spare me a minute or two about that. The first 13 colonies America were surveyed by the European method, which was chaos. Uh, they follow a river, they follow a, a significant tree, uh, <laughs> an outcrop of rock, something like that. Remember, these were colonial people who had to uh, send taxes and things back to Europe. So what they wanted to do was glom as big a piece of land as they could, but describe it as a small piece of land. So they would cut down a tree, they'd plant a new one, they'd burn down an old building, they'd do all kinds of tricks that they were doing. Jefferson realized that he, to stop this chaos, he had to have a regular system. He'd been to France, and in France, what they had done, just to give you an example of that chaos, uh, a bushel of fish sold on the uh, shoreline of France was way cheaper than a bushel of fish in Paris as you moved in. It was all still a bushel. But what people did was make the bushel smaller. And, and the bushel size would flex, depending on where they could make the 
most money. So he knew you have to stabilize these things and stabilize the measurements. I think it's his third law was the stabilizing the weights of measurements in, in, in America. He realized how important that was. <coughs> so he felt the only way you could do it with a country that was half uh, non-literate was to have a strong visual system, and thus a grid is something everyone can understand, and to lay a grid out on it and to do it. The first 13 colonies, the, the uh, surveying as it was, stayed the way they were for a long time until people went back and surveyed them by modern law. The <coughs> first state to try to get it right was Ohio. And they had a lot of troubles, a lot of corruption, and they got it all off. The first state to do it right is Michigan. The first line that was drawn correctly is baseline. Now for me, that's kind of an exciting and interesting thing. I grew up, never knew what baseline meant. Why is it sometimes baseline? Why is it sometimes eight mile? It's crazy, but it isn't crazy. Baseline is a line, and it's sometimes imaginary. It just goes over a surveyed space. Sometimes it's a road. When it's a road in perfect coordination, then they call it eight mile. But it was eight miles from the original surveying state, which is in downtown Detroit. And uh, they came out from that. To do it. So when this became the kind of invisible history that interests me a lot as an artist, and how do you make that something that everyone can relate to? How can you intrigue people into the story and, and tell it in such a way that has meaning? All of our laws come off of these baselines. Everything, our, where our garage is placed, is somehow relative to that baseline. Everything and yet we don't know, know it or understand it. So my dream has been that this project goes on long after <coughs> me and continues to go uh, march across the state until we have something that's a kind of magnet that pulls tourists and other people along that will make, we'll make it a mission to go to every one of these obelisks, just as some people go to every lighthouse, every national park. They get something in mind and they go to it. It's all, they've already been used as geocaching and other kinds of things because uh, people are in treatment. So on the obelisk, and the obelisk itself is inspired by the surveyor's pole and also the way that they originally marked it. But we engrave on them something different in every community. And so far what we've done is involve the schools in that. So usually I think it's a fifth grade classes that are doing Michigan history and they research it. One has something on there that's critical about the history of Southfield. It's something about the early people, something about the early uh, economic structure, where they farmers, what, what they do, and so on. So you try to tell the story on it. <coughs> the sides of the obelisk, to me, represent what I think of as the four collisions of, of thinking about land. Right? The collisions are the aristocratic, and that was the king said he owned everything, period, end of report. Then it was the colonial, which was you were, you were trying to measure it and pay something back to England that you did it. That was a different system. Then it's the Jeffersonian system, which is the grid and lay it out. And then it is the Native American, which is you can't do any of this. So it's those four different ideas that are in collision. The city of Battle Creek is named Battle Creek because it was a battle between the uh, Native Americans and the surveyors. We all know when we see surveyors, something else is coming. You know, when you see it, you, you know. Right? You look, uh-oh, what's this? Or, goody, that's what's this. We don't know. So all of those things are kind of a loaded story that's untold. And so my idea is that we come here, and Harry learned about this, and I uh, came to the know by one, uh, come to communities that are receptive and get the community involved in some way. Uh, and to do that, the first phase is to get this council to say, this is an interesting project. This is something we would like to have 
in, in our in our community we have this take place that we'd be part of this fabric that goes across lines borders uh, maps all of these things both divide people and connect them they, they do both things at one time and it's how do you want it to be interpreted how do you want this story to be told so that's motivation and that's the motivation for me um, usually what we've done is we get the community to respond and eventually uh, we get permission for these as it comes out then we approach the school board or some teachers or a group of teachers and have them start to research have the kids do something and the kids might do little drawings of a historic house or something that's there that I translate that and put it on the obelisk in some way we have uh, stories or quotes or other sorts of things are there. Some things are already so strong that we have to have, uh, tell the story on the obelisk about the Jeffersonian concept. <coughs> All of those materials are, are, are there for you to see as they go on. Um, the, the, the obelisk itself is made in Vermont and uh, the only place to be big granite pieces, there's only two places in America, Vermont or Minnesota, where they have the equipment to do things like this. So they, they machine it out of two different granites, and according to my design, and then we engrave these things on it out there, ship it here in two pieces, and install it on the site, usually with some ceremony. Each site to me can has its own unique surroundings, plantings, other things that the community might want to do. I really want it to be an interactive project. Project. I've done interactive projects all over the world. New Guinea, Africa, Greenland, Russia, all sorts of things. And when I first come in, I, they usually think I'm nuts. And by the time I leave, we are usually have a lot of friends. And a lot of people realize this has been an interesting project. And this is my idea of what art can do, is that art tr transcends politics, religion, economics, divide, arts connect. And so how do we go about doing that? And do you want to be part of that? That's what I'm putting out in front of you. Um, I think I'll just see if there's any questions at this point. Mr. Lamb? No. I asked a question previous. What is the size of this? This? Well, the one that you were saying to. Ten, ten feet. Huh? They're ten feet high. How wide is it? So it's about like that. Where is that one? This, this one, I, I no, I don't buy. That is what size? Like that. They're all the same. That to me looks like twelve feet. By no, it's just a trick photography. I guess. Well, that's a blown up picture. There, there's a. All right, now. Yeah. It's all granite, the white is granite, the black is granite. Correct. How did you get the white and the black and white? Well, you cut you cut them down into slabs, shape the whole thing. We have a uh, rod that goes through the center of it, and epoxy it all together. Use the metal? Epoxy. Epoxy. Yeah. Yeah, you could, you could throw that in the lake, and it would be there 500 years later. <laughs> so I mean they're very no, well they're, they're very durable. Right. They don't need right. they don't need a bunch of you have the map on there. Right. Can we go back to that map for a second? Yeah. Alright, I'll you tell you about that map. Too? Is that inscribed on it? Yes. The green the green is the newly surveyed state of Michigan. The blue is the old French map. And you see, the French were not interested in land. You know, all they wanted were furs. And all they wanted was to get to the furs. And they got to the furs by water. So it's all just water. So it tells the story of what the, how the French viewed it and what went, uh, went on to it. So I put them two both together so you can see the contrast <coughs> as it went on. The, the, uh, I've been through the whole files in Lansing where the surveyors work. They're amazing documents. And starting in about 1850, <coughs> these guys were heroic. 
the only time to survey was really in winter because the only time you could walk over swamps and all sorts of things was when it was <coughs> they didn't they had to use a little stubby pencil <laughs> sometimes and the only way they could do it was back in the tent at the end of the night they were so cold out there most of the time and uh, they, they went through unbelievable difficulties to do this stuff and to lay it out they, they have a chain which I've got it chain and one a view of the chain is engraved on the stone. The chain was about sixty feet long. It beautifully made things. They discovered that when a chain freezes, it's shorter than when it's in the in the summer. Doesn't sound like much, it's a tiny bit of sixty feet, but by the time you got to South Haven, Michigan, you've lost about a mile. <laughs> it would all add up. So they had to each periodically heat the chain and then stretch it out and do their measurements. Heat the chain and stretch it out. Fabulous story. That's a dumpster chain. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. One more question. Sure. Who was paying for that? Well, the community will have to pay for it. Who? Oh. The community. Each place the community is paid for. How much is it going to cost? This is the it's, first about, it's about $12,000. This is the first time I'm hearing there's money involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's done through fundraising because it's a not-for-profit. Not I don't get anything. It's about $12,000 for the monument and the and foundation. The community has to pay for it? They raised their we place. Raised the place. Place. They've had fundraisers. They've done various things. They've had a patron. They found somebody who will and come you up with have, you, have the, you have the fundraiser set up already? Who no, you can't it? have a fundraiser until we have a project. And if I could, through the chair, uh, this picture is a Boy Scout who adopted this as his Eagle Scout project. And he helped raise the money through donations on buying the bricks and helped the community put it together. Well, that's fine. Get the Boy Scouts to well, come in here. Well, the, the Boy Scouts is a possibility. <laughs> Historical Society, the Arts Council, there, there are many different avenues for raising the funds, but we have to get permission first before we can even start the project. And it's about a 9 to 12 month project to build the story and to raise the funds. And who's going to be in charge of the funding? Well, we're going to select the people to do the fundraising. Well, usually that's what we, uh, our, the next step is to round those people up and to get them. Yeah, we, we go to a Who's going to round them up? You? What, I'll be involved in that, I'm sure. But we'll go to the historical commission and other people. Usually, or not usually, every time, somebody in the community or some group in the community has stepped forward, which is what they have to do. I built the, did the same thing with a 38-acre <coughs> park up in northern Michigan. We went up there. It's all sweat equity. Not, nothing. We didn't get grants. We didn't get anything. Well, and what I would say, let's turn it around a little bit. Let's, you or somebody, organize the fundraising first. Well, I'll, then we'll know. I, pre I appreciate your concerns. But I, I will tell you, psychologically, it doesn't work that way. Because something, fundraiser for what? Something that may or may not happen. You know, they, the people really don't want to do it. They want to know this is going to happen, and how do we make it happen? So I find what I've been doing here and in other countries that the problem is the most interesting thing. And the problem is, how do you get people involved? If some one wealthy person comes along in any community and says, we're going to do this, you'll love it. It may or may not happen. But the people probably won't love it. But when you go to a community and say, this is in your interest, and your children will like this, and your teachers will like this, and your parents will like this, then something happens. That makes it way more meaningful to me. So uh, we, we've become very cautious and want everything lined up ahead of time. I find that we actually stifle creativity when we do it. That's my point of view. All right, now. What's the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing that can happen? People are going to refuse to donate. To, to and then what would happen? Huh? And then what would happen? Nothing. So that's the worst thing that could happen. 
We're, we're not at that That's point. That's what's happening right now. We're not at that point. Let me tell you something. It may be a point. It may be a point where nobody would want to donate to it. Sure. Sure. Okay? And the city I'm is taking the same risk. risk. I'm sure the city is not going to do it. I didn't ask the city. I, I'm telling you. I know you didn't ask. <coughs> You're going to have to go to private people to raise the money to do that. That's right. All right. Giving permission is easy. That's a, that's a good one. Right. But, uh, all right. I'll stop here. Um, I uh, agree with my colleague's comment in terms of we can ask some of the questions. What does this cost? And, and who's going to do the fundraising? Is it then going to be your responsibility? To go out well, well, through the chair. No, oh, through the chair. No, I'm, I'm I will assist in identifying key stakeholders, such as the Historical Society and the Art Council, and help coordinate that. that that's all my role will be. I've, I've identified a potential site that's that the city owns that wouldn't, wouldn't preclude any future development. It's on 8 Mile. We don't have a park on 8 Mile, but this at Rutland. In 8 Mile, we have a site. Possibly, this would be donated to the city, but we would need um, your blessing to have it constructed and, and built. And my role would just be as a, a coordinator. Now, we'd have to give you permission to do it. That's what we're here for. Uh, we don't know yet whether you'll get permission to build that thing. Mm -hmm. We well, just want the opportunity to explore it. And then, if, if, as Mr. Barr said, if we can't raise the funds, there's no harm done and nothing will be built. But if we can get to like 75% of the goal, that then we can come back no, to no, the council. No, no, you need permission first from us before you start raising yeah. it. That's, that's what I said. I, we're asking permission to start to start the project. Yeah. 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 Give it. That's it, I'm done. Are you done? All right. Uh, Mr. Fertossi. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely great. Uh, it's, uh, you know, 8 Mile Road, uh, it's been such a significant uh, road through the years. That's why the Eight Mile Road Boulevard Association was formed to try to coordinate the 37 miles that go from here to the east. <coughs> and I, uh, I think it's a great idea. And I hope that everybody along the way uh, gets involved in their particular city. And, and I think Southfield should be. Uh, like it always has been right in the forefront of this. So I, I just was uh, uh, looking at the site from a planning standpoint. Uh, is that the um, uh, DDA area that... that uh, it's within the DDA district. You know, I'm talking about the, the, who does the property belong to? The, the property is approximately one acre and it's owned by the city. Okay. And we designed it in such a way, we've actually laid a template for future development, so it wouldn't preclude... That, that's my question, only that it does not uh, mess up, uh, if somebody wants the corner for exposure, does that take away from it, or does that contribute to I, I the architecture of the development? You know, it, I mean, it's within the landscape <coughs> setback, sure. so it would, I think it would enhance. I'm absolutely in favor of it. I think it's a great idea, and... Uh, Great location. And then this, this is maybe yeah. an overly optimistic, but if we raise enough funds and we can get enough partners, we can create something more than just a, a patio of brick pavers. So there's from what you've seen up there to actually creating an urban gateway, a gateway into the city and a gateway into the EDA district. But that's getting way ahead of ourselves. Yeah. That's th and we would come back, obviously, if we we were successful. Well, you know, <coughs> I'm not knocking other projects, but we spent money on projects that, you know, just uh, blew up in our face. And this is something I think has real merit. <coughs> I, I, I really like it myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Fercati's comment about the significance and how South can be included. I'm just curious as to, you've done this, what, in Novi, in Northville, and what other, uh, anyway? Farmington. Far, are you 
looking to you know, expand oh, yeah, all right. the way outside of Oakland County yeah, to any other media plans, or are you can no, only kind of tackle well, one community we're at a time. Take somebody to lie in right now. Okay. But uh, there's a guy in uh, the other terminus in uh, uh, South Haven, oh, Principal on uh, Baseline Road, mm -hmm. right there, who's always been interested. But of course, everyone comes to the same thing: the fundraising. Yeah. And how do we do it? Yeah. Yeah, and this is this is for me. I have lots of projects and lots of things I'm doing. And I do this when I can. I've got my wife is very ill. I've got health problems, so I'm not able to do a zillion things. Right. But uh, we, we push it along the best we can. No, we appreciate you coming. At a certain point, it will speak for itself. People will go by and say, "What are those things? Yeah. And why don't we have one?" And, and through the chair, just to mention, Mr. Moss. Um, I've spoken to Tammy Salisbury, the director of the Mount Board of our Association. <coughs> She's fully in support of this. And they're looking to do one at the old state fairgrounds uh, where the new development is. And she suggested that if the timing was right, there might be some economies of scale if we were able to do two at the sure. same time. But we don't want to commit ourselves, but that is the most the next um, one that they've been working on. <coughs> this is the one at Detroit Woodward. Mm -hmm. I, I have a few questions about the design itself. There are four sides. Some of them are existing. You have, you know, what's going to be on it based on what's on the other ones. Here and there, not all, just okay. entirely. And it's how exactly have you, uh, you know, engaged other communities in, in creating the design? How would you want to engage Southfielders? Because I think there's this committee that should drive this, okay. which should be a city committee, which might have a historian, a teacher, and so on. They will determine this, and uh, I will be there to help them determine okay. what do we put on and where. I don't, I don't just fish something out of here and right. put it on there. Right. Well, I, 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 uh, I think the council is interested in it. Um, it just sounds like a good project, um, and uh, I'm, I think we're going to. I mean, I personally uh, just want to keep engaged and, and see how this goes along mm -hmm. and how we can be helpful. Um, I guess Mr. Simon, mm -hmm. um, you don't know um, or are not familiar with uh, Mr. Barr's work, um, down in Hart Plaza, the uh, Monument to Labor. That's right. It's on Jefferson Avenue um, at the edge of Hart Plaza. That's it's it's transcending is uh, That's right. the name of it. There's other ones in there. Um, he's done some, some marvelous stuff, so uh, I feel uh, Honored that you'd, you'd want to do something in Southfield okay. personally, and I, I think our community is begging for more public art. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've talked about this before. Um, I go places and and I just see beautiful installations, and, and um, we just don't have enough of it. Um, and something you said, Mr. Barr, uh, uh, really struck home with me. Um, uh, we decided uh, in my neighborhood we have um, a couple of neighborhood-owned parks, and we decided that we wanted to um, do an art installation, a sculpture in one of the parks. And we had somebody who said, "Well, I'll pay for it. Uh, I'm so excited, I'll pay for it." And you know, we told him, you, "No, don't don't pay for it. Contribute to it." Yeah, and what we did was we went around in the neighborhood. And uh, people gave a hundred dollars. They gave twenty. They gave five. Um, and there were the naysayers that said, "Oh, it's going to be vandalized. It's going to be ruined." Well, this is ten years ago. It's standing. The flowers have grown around it. Um, nothing has happened to it. And um, there's neighborhood ownership in it. Um, and I think your concept really could work here. That we would get people on board with this. Um, and I, for one, would uh, volunteer to help raise funds for this. Um, uh, I, I would, I think uh, $12,000 is not insurmountable. It's a well, I believe it was 12, but um, at any rate, uh, I would be willing to um, work on the fundraising. I'm fully in support of this. And, you know, we talk about place, and this is one of our connections to place. Um, like it or not, we're on 8 Mile. Uh, 8 Mile is our border. Um, and and um, we can, uh, it, it's, it's the way I feel about our mid-century modern buildings. 
Uh, we have them. We should promote them because it's it's, it's something that that we are. It's who we are. And uh, eight miles covers six miles of the city. So um, it'd be great uh, to to add this to uh, our uh, appreciation of uh, public spaces and place. So uh, I'm fully in support of this. I could just respond to that for one second. In, in some of the workshops I've done with students, they either a cell phone or a GPS. And when you, you do them, you're locating yourself off of satellites, which is in itself an extraordinary moment in human history that you can do that, that you can find where you are. You are locating yourself basically on the planet, but also in the universe. And only you are in that spot that this indicates. It's, 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 when a kid realizes how important that is, that this is where they are, this is them in this spot. And those are the kind of things that we engrave GPS is on this. And it's, a, it's an awareness, it's a tremendous awareness as to what, what goes on. It's an opportunity to do that awareness. Okay, I have a question. Yes. <coughs> the twelve thousand dollars that you uh, suggested, is that just for the obelisk or is that for the completed project? I think it's the obelisk delivered you know, delivered to the site. Okay, so it, so it depends what you want to do there. And this and this one the Boy Scouts put in that whole thing. They yeah. raised the money and they did all but everything else that's there. But the uh, center of attention right. is the twelve thousand dollars. Right. I just wanted to sure. clarify that. Okay, I want to ask uh, part of the question that I wanted to ask. Brick pavers, we would have to, that's separate, we would have to raise money or do that. You may not want brick pavers. Well, we, yeah. but, but if yeah. we did. Yes, I mean, we anything would. Else, the 12000 is just for the monument, whatever, right. like the installation. Right. Does that include the installation of it? It brings it to the site. But Usually, well, people have things like city, uh, uh, city workers with... Uh, what does it take to put it on the site? Really Just something to pick it up. A foundation. Yeah. And it has to be stole. poured and then something that would okay, place I'll it on. That's the cost, right? Yeah. I'm trying to get a handle on sure. it. Sure. Because when you presented it at the president's meeting, the, it was a little different about the fundraising. So you need a committee? Is that what you're saying? Generally, a committee is established? I think you want the committee. Yes. Mm -hmm. you do. Because we were told fundraising would not be yeah. our. No, if you're I not, could through the chair, the committee, it's not, but I think the city. If I could through the no, chair, because I was at the council president. Right. What what I said was that the city would not be responsible for fundraising or paying anything. They could, Mr. Charette said, you know, they could do some in kind thing, but we would help identify a, a committee of key stakeholders that would do the fundraising, and that that the cost of the obelisk was about twelve thousand dollars. 12 to 14 with the foundation, and then anything above and beyond that that we would want to do would be part and parcel to the fundraising effort, whether it's bricks that, that, that put was in not, by... That was not discussed, so Terry. That was the, the discussion that I had was that he does the fundraising for this, and that's not the situation. I just want to be clear on that. Um, any other questions? I, I think we need to... Uh, I, see, I see value in, in terms of having it in the community, but my concern is really the what dollars is it going to take to have it done? Uh, we've got one figure of $12,000 and then we we'll go back for the other uh, mm -hmm. papers. We don't know what those costs and are. The right, so I'd like to see really what it would cost to have this done and what um, strategies. That's would something we would have to determine. Mm -hmm. We would have to determine that that's the cost that we want to do. That's something he can't do. No, I'm, I'm yeah, really well, we could easily. Uh, I, I think this is just a simple thing. Uh, I would volunteer along with Ken Seibert. I'd volunteer him to form a committee if we need one more <laughs> for Jeremy. Find me out. The three of us and let us dig into it and we'll lay out the. Okay. We'll lay it out and see what we have to do and we'll work with Terry and Mr. Barr and we'll get it done. Right, You'll come back with what the dollars are. Sure. We'll, yeah. take we'll come up with the plan and right. the design and what it's going to look like. And but you're requesting approval tonight to go ahead. So that means we need a motion to start this. Wait a minute. I just heard Don saying you will make the, you will pay for the design. No. <laughs> no. 
You need your batteries. What I said was that this committee will take care of us. Well, you know, somebody's got to start no, moving. How are you I, mean, I want to do artwork all the way down Telegraph Road in the median from 8 Mile Road to I-696 and do something different. I want outdoor sculptures that whole length in front of Lear and everything else and, and be an exciting city again. And we sit back here and 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 just, you know, let's take the initiative and get it done. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Section 1 it is actually Greenfield and 8 Mile Road. I, I believe it goes. If you look at it here. Sex, it's section yeah. 1. That's for, it, it, it's well, look at, it's look at 36, the map. There's 36 yeah. square miles, 6 by 6. Yeah, but six yeah. Six yeah. section 1 it goes down to the quarter of section 1. And then back and forth all the way up to 36. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I want to be completely open about everything I'm doing. Yeah. If you want to form a group, yeah. uh, I live in Northville. I know by Napier Road. I have four acres of sculpture. Some are 20 some feet high pieces out there. It's a, it's, it is itself an art park. And so, if you'd like the group to come out and take a little tour of it and talk further, the more they're welcome. I'd love to. Yep. Okay, first of all, I want to clarify something. Anyway. Um, go ahead. I, are you I, I would just like to move that a committee be formed. That would be the mm -hmm. first action. And then I would. No, no, no. Co coexist with my comrades here, Mr. Cyber and, and Mr. Moss, and we'll, we'll come back to council with the plans and, and how we're going to have our fundraisers and okay, raise the money. I want to say one thing, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. There was, I don't remember, and I don't think others remember, any, any kind of work being volunteered. So let's not. Uh, I'm not I'm just, I want to clarify, because it was brought up, I think, by Mr. Crowe, and uh, I don't think that was... Um, Are we going to volunteer the employees in Southfield? That was not a question. No, we, we're not going to put that in motion. We can't do that. We can't volunteer. Oh, hey, that. Jerry Crowe's been, been giving him... I mean, why are we fighting this thing? I mean, just, you know, yeah, and anyway. just switch from the committee, and we'll come back, and, and, and we'll get the job done. That's right. I'm on the Rule 10 support. And then I, uh, do you want to make the motion, Don? Well, we well, got to vote on your rule 10. Yeah. 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 What is your motion, Don? That, that a committee do? of uh, Mr. Cyber, Mr. Moss, myself, will, will uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to get you involved. I'll, I'll, I'll I, I want you to be, you know. I'd like to be involved. You're, you're, I want you to chair this three. So okay, I'd like to be involved. And, and yes, absolutely. Yeah. Involved. And, and Mr. Barrow will be involved. Yeah. And the schools will be involved. We'll get this thing going. But anyway, yeah. just form the committee. And right. and and so this first motion would be to, no. to have a committee no. to review this and come back mm -hmm. to council because it's council's land yeah. for approval. Mm -hmm. And a committee will report back to the council. Right. That's the motion that's presented. All right. I have a rule 10 that I move. Yes, you do. If you're going to vote on this, you don't take action. Motion for Mr. Saber, Saber for rule 10, supported by Mr. Picasso, by Mr. Moss. All in favor? Aye. And to come back with council with a plan and a um, and a cost, of it and that no in-house no in-house dollars will be spent in its completion or its development or anything else. But we may ask that council give us the use of the land in which to put the monument on. And
communities are eligible to receive a portion of a policy of a, uh, of a residential or business owner's insurance proceeds before a final uh, payout is made to that uh, homeowner. So uh, until the structure is repaired, replaced, or demolished, at which time the escrow funds would be released by the municipality uh, to the property owner. Basically, the act allows the city to establish an escrow account for holding a portion of the insurance uh, of the insured's insurance proceeds. Once in, uh, I just want to, uh, touch on. The, municip the municipality may use the funds to repair, replace, or demolish the damaged structure. I did use this act. Um, the, in Taylor, we implemented this in 2006. The first year we had it in place, we used it for seven properties, uh, and we received insurance proceeds to pay the cost of demolishing those homes. Prior to that, those uh, demolitions most, like, most likely would have been expenditures of the general fund. The, uh, how can uh, Southfield participate? The Office of, of Financial uh, and Insurance Regulation uh, in Lansing, housed within the uh, LARA office, uh, states that, the, uh, that uh, they compile a list and they maintain a list of participating communities. If you went to a li the list today, there's a whole list of communities in there. The list is updated quarterly. It is sent electronically to all property and casualty insurance companies. Each participating community um, We have, we, the municipality must pass a resolution and submit uh, to the Office of Financial Insurance Regulation along with the completed appropriate application. Uh, upon the receipt of the application will be 30 days uh, before, it's, uh, on, be, be, before it goes on to the state's website. There are two different sections of the law. There is a uh, section 227 of the insurance code, and that applies to counties of more than 425,000, uh, and that currently includes Genesee, Kent, Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne counties, or cities of 50,000, <coughs> regardless of the size of the county. Uh, and we, I, we, I show a couple. Ann Arbor's not enrolled in the program. Battle Creek is enrolled. Kalamazoo is enrolled. Mm -hmm. Lansing, Saginaw, Gypsy are enrolled. Uh, Section 2845 re, uh, applies to all other municipalities. So we're looking at section 227 in the code. So what's the difference uh, between the two? The uh, definition uh, for those communities for under section 2227 pertains to not just properties damaged by fire uh, or explosion, it, but it also includes losses uh, caused by the pearls of vandalism, malicious uh, mischief, wind, hail, riot, or, or civil uh, commotion. So it's a broader definition uh, under the section that we fall under. Are, the, are all losses covered by this program? No. Losses caused by pearls are referenced above uh, and must, uh, they must meet the following guidelines of the program. The damage uh, must exceed 49% of the insured uh, on the real property. Obviously, the property must be located within our municipal boundaries. Um, and the insurance company has no evidence that the insured has hired a, a licensed contractor for repairs to the property within 15 days after the agreement on, on final settlement. Um, the program requires some monitoring on every fire. Fire Marshal usually is doing that now. They have a relationship with the insurance companies. There's a constant dialogue going on. Um, the escrow would be set up in the treasurer's office, and our, we, our fire marshal, the fire department, and the building department would work with those insurance companies. How do the insurance companies uh, calculate the escrowed amount? Um, the amount is 25% of the actual cash value of the insured uh, <coughs> real property at the, at the time of the loss. So the best uh, way to do that is to... Um, you know, we usually take a look at what the assessor has it on the rolls, what's the true cash value, 25% of that, um, of the insurance. So upon a fire, we would notify the insurance company that there's been a fire, and we expect them to put, if the true cash value of property is 200000 we would say 25% of those escrowed funds uh, uh, 
would be 50,000, but on resident, residential properties, there is a limit of $8,129. That's the amount effective September 1st of, of 2012. On commercial buildings, though, it is the full 25%. So an office building burns down, we, we would be asking the insurance company to put up 25% of the true cash value of the building. Um, and it said there's no maximum. The maximum escrow amount uh, that the, uh, the total that can be in the account or the maximum per claim, the maximum escrow amount uh, which is updated annually is per policy, not the total amount that can be in the account. So if the policy has a limit, we still have to stay with the individual homeowner's policy or commercial property, we would stay within that limit of the 25%. How does the program work? The insurance company has a responsibility to notify the city. If the city wishes to be proactive, the city may contact the insurance company. If known, to remind the insurance company that losses are, uh, has occurred and the city requests having the uh, eligible amount of the settlement placed in escrow. My experience uh, with the city of Taylor of the fires we had, probably three quarters of them notified us that they, you know, before any checks were cut out. We had to chase on, on two of them, if I recall correctly. <coughs> Responsibilities of the insurance company and municipality in the event of a loss, here's the, the steps that need to be followed. Within 15 days after agreement on a final settlement between the insured and the insurer, the insurance company determines whether the loss meets the guidelines of the program. If the insured has filed, filed with the insurer's evidence of a contract to repair the property, and consents to the payment of the funds directly to the contractor performing the repair services, the insurer should notify the participating community. There will not be a withholding because of the repair contract. We would, pre we would prefer as a community that the properties always be repaired. So the insurance company, if the homeowner or the property owner, they agree to have the property repaired, it's repaired, no monies would come to the Southfield. If the program eligibility guidelines are met, meaning that 49% of the property, they're not going to repair the house, the program, uh, the insurer sends written notice of the withholding to the person the city would list. Uh, we're recommending that person be the city treasurer uh, to the insured and to the uh, mortgagee. The, the municipality has 15 days after the ma mailing of notice from the insurance company to respond and request the, the withheld amount to be paid into its escrow account. A copy of the municipality's response to the insurance company to have the funds paid in the escrow account must also be sent to the insured and any mortgages advising them that they have 10 days from the mailing to object to the retention of the uh, withheld amount. When can the money be dispersed after it has been escrowed? The city must immediately forward the policy, the insurance proceeds, uh, except for any interest earned uh, while in escrow to the insured or to the service contractor as outlined uh, below. Funds are to be paid uh, to the insured once the structure has been repaired or replaced, at least to the point where the remaining funds are needed to complete such work or remove in compliance with local code requirements. If the insured has entered into a contract for repair or replacement or removal of the damaged structure and consents to payment of the funds directly to the contractor upon completion of the project, the insured uh, may seek resolution with the municipality or seek relief in circuit court if they feel the municipality has not properly dispersed the funds. There's usually a constant chain of communication going on between the fire marshal and the building department and what happens. If I don't have my home or my commercial property under repair, within that 15 day period, we will hold the insurance proceeds in the event that the home doesn't come down. If on 30 days after the fire, they enter into a repair to the home, then the city would release the funds that were sitting in our escrow account.
What if the property owner wants to sell their property as is and the new owner agrees uh, to the repairs? <coughs> the municipality is not obligated to release the funds until the hazard is repaired, replaced, or demolished. The funds should be released to the insured at that time where the insured may receive relief in circuit court. Again, it strengthens the city's position to deal with these blights in the event that the property owner fails to or doesn't care to or wants to sell the, the property to someone else. We have the right to protect the city's interest here. Uh, why do some people and some of you uh, MML? And that was the first time I was introduced to the act is that a Michigan Municipal League training program. Um, I still refer to it as uh, Public Act 495. Uh, some of you may have heard that in some of the MML presentations under Section 2845 of the Insurance Code. Public Act uh, 495 was replaced in January 1999 with Public Act 216, now referred to as Section 2845, and Public Act 217 is now the uh, 2227, uh, which divided the, pro the previous program into two parts with participation in each part determined by, by population. Uh, check would be made payable to the municipality. It will not be a two-party check. What if the insurance company fails to notify the city about the escrow opportunity and pay the insured in full? Um, if the loss meets all the criteria and the insurance company <laughs> settled the claim without providing the municipality the opportunity to have a portion of the money put in an escrow account, the municipality should file a written complaint uh, with the state the complaint should address the name of the policy holder. This was one of the experiences I did have in Taylor, and when I left in 2008, in Canada with you, it still was not resolved. Fire was mid-2006, so <coughs> after the claim's been paid, the city's not in the strongest position. It was tied up in the Wayne County Circuit Court system. I wouldn't say it's the fastest system. Um, <coughs> Next steps, adoption of, of a resolution uh, stating, and I've outlined the resolution. This is verbatim from what the state requires um, in, in the act. Uh, legal is reviewed, each of the whereas is. We present this at the next meeting, and here's the result. <coughs> the city of Southfield does hereby become participating uh, municipality in a program for ESCO as established by Act 4, 495 and the various amendments and that we would list the Wallenberg uh, as our uh, trustee agent and we still need to determine which bank the ESCO funds would be. Um, Until we meet the parameters, and if we have to take the house down, 
then it can be used to take the house down. But it's not our money. We simply hold it in escrow. And, and, and I like the point the city they can, try they can hire a contractor and, 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 and spend all the money oh, if they're enrolled. If it's up the house, they're on a list. Does the city can't say anything? Uh, they're they're well, they don't even have to refund that money yeah. back. Yeah. If they're fixing the house up, the money goes back to them. Oh, so it's not uh, mandatory that they do that to the homeowner. If they decide they're not going to fix the house up, we would probably hold. Okay, that's a different question. Okay. If they are, the money goes back to them to complete the and repair. If they refuse to do that. If they refuse to repair, yeah. we the money then that we have in escrow could be used to either repair the house or demolish it if <coughs> it's not repairable. Okay. But they're allowed to repair it without. Oh. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Well, that's what I'm trying to clear okay. up my then mind. Okay, you're absolutely right. They certainly okay. have the right to repair it. And we legally have to, once they have a contract to repair that, we legally have to release those Take funds within 15 days. So we're obligated to give it back through the chair. Mr. Lance, think of it as a performance bond, the same way when you go in to build a building and you have mm -hmm. to, you have to do a, give them a bond to perform, and if you don't perform properly, you could lose that bond. Basically, this, this is the same, same type of, same type of action. Yeah. Um, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, through the chair. Uh, I was going to run over, run through a few uh, recent fires, and uh, Marshall Dundas, if you don't mind coming up, you can. Uh, I have a list of recent fires that we've had here in the city of Southfield. Uh, I have a list of uh, about. Oh, here there. These are fires, uh, recent, these are vacancies uh, that were caused by fire up through January of 2012. There's about 68 mm -hmm. vacant homes in our city right now. I don't, I don't, I can't say that all of those would qualify under the program, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm sure that some of them would. Um, these are a few samples. Um, this is a fire we had on Southwood. Uh, this home, I drove by it uh, earlier today. Uh, the fire occurred back in um, March, or uh, excuse me, April 8th of 2012. Uh, this is a fire that uh, was under investigation. I'll let uh, Marshall Dundas talk about that. But it was an insured home, and it still uh, looks like this in the neighborhood today. And um, do you want to give a little bit of background on this? And this this home here would fall under the criteria of the withholding act. Um, this is a difficult investigation for us and a pretty complicated case, but uh, this was an arson case that uh, people who were not home at the time. Typically when homes get damaged beyond 49 percent, it's because people weren't home at the time or because it's a vacant building. It's because of the res good response time we have, the delay in reporting the fire is what causes the fire's exit to stay. Uh, in any case, um, the, the home was insured. Uh, we make sure that the house gets boarded up before we leave there so no one gets in there and gets hurt and then no one can steal anything that might still be uh, worth the value in there. And um, this, uh, we've gotten a lot of complaints about this house. It's uh, definitely a blight in a very nice neighborhood uh, in Southfield. And uh, uh, as it is, uh, the insurance uh, issues are still uh, in question. There's a significant criminal element to this particular case that I can't really talk about now, but uh, it's, a, it's a, an ugly, dangerous house and a very nice neighborhood. And uh, if we had the ability to uh, withhold some money, so maybe we could speed the process of cleaning these things up. And what we don't want uh, the, the owner to do is collect on the insurance company and walk it away and leave it in the city's hands in this condition. And, that, and, and that, that happens a lot as a result of the uh, declining values of property where someone uh, would get their insurance money and see that it's easier to buy a house across the street than to pay a contractor to come in and repair it and they can put money in their pocket as a result of fire and that's what we're trying to prevent. And the maximum amount held on this would be that increased figure. The reality is this is probably a 15 to 17 thousand dollars. The other thing <coughs> to keep in mind is these claims are based on replacement time. That's correct. Okay, so that's that's how uh, you know that's how you know, that's what Mr. Dundas is saying here is there you know it, it's it's a higher price it's a, the, the check is much bigger than the value yeah, of the, value the, right, right. No, the sales price of the home. Right, and it, it, as a result, we have an increase yeah. in arson cases and things like that, but it's also. Uh, 
you know, if if the person takes their check and just walks away from the property like this, it takes a while, uh, no offense, Mr. Board, but the, the, the legal process takes a while to get to the point where the city can demolish the house and remove the hazard and lien the property to try to recover that. And that takes a long time and there's a costly process as well. And this would expedite those things and make it easier for us to clean up uh, things. I should have started with a little disclaimer. My job is fire chief and our job as firefighters are to make sure it never gets to this stage. Mm -hmm. Quick response, um, uh, uh, a quick knockdown on a fire. And we have very, very few fires. Um, we run on 1,700 fire runs a year. We have about a hundred major fires, so most of them are not down, and that's our job to do is to keep them from getting to the state. Is that, uh, Chief, before you go on to the next one, is that the way it is today? That's the way it is. Well, why isn't that boarded up? To well, uh, it, it is boarded. Uh, uh, the, the garage door was <coughs> destroyed, so this is plywood uh, painted similar color to the house. The windows are all boarded up. Uh, the windows are all boarded up. Uh, the windows are all boarded up. Uh, the windows are all boarded up. The windows are all boarded up. Boarding up the roof structure is a significant project. You know, I'm talking about uh, a manner in which somebody could walk in and somebody could go in and. The property is secured with. Uh, it's the Everything on the first floor is secured. Okay. Uh, all up above is burned out. And okay. it, it has yellow tape still around it. It's, it's very it's similar quite, to the one we just. It's right. very similar to the one we just tore down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think uh, and it's the same as it was to a fire yeah. two years before mm -hmm. we took it through the tax foreclosure process. Yeah, here's another picture of that same house on the This was a house on Framingham. Um, it was a fire we had uh, back at the beginning of the year, um, one of the coldest days of the year. Uh, it, it sat this way uh, for quite a while. Um, it's, it's now demolished. I was over there this morning and took this picture. Uh, the house was removed, uh, but there's still a hazard. This is this is a, a basement that was removed and it's dug out, and it, it really presents a hazard for the neighborhood, the neighborhood kids. Um, if, if this was a construction site and I had workers down in there, I would pull them out because they're not proper shoring, they're not following proper procedures. So this this as a as a yeah, uh, emergency uh, provider worries me. So, so why wasn't it that? Uh, pardon me. Why wasn't it that still? That, I, mean, I, that I don't know. I just, I just found this in this condition today. I'll have a picture of another one that was back built. Uh, I don't know if they're going to come in and put a basement in. I'm not sure what the plan is, but I, I'm, I'm going to follow up on this because uh, I didn't feel comfortable. Part of the issue, this is still, this Mr. Lansford has still found the other property. Our rights to enter the property are pretty much determined by court action. And monthly we get a report um, <coughs> the, the I get a, each month then we get a report of legal actions and there's actions happening on, on every property but you're, you're subject to court and going through that process as well. Now one where there's a basement that's also a, uh, a risk of mosquitoes, a mosquito breeding place. I'm sure it's holding water. Um, if, I, if I can, why would, they had to get a permit to demolish the house. We don't require them to, once the demolition to ensure the place is safe? We don't require that? I'm not sure if this, yeah. this is... Uh, so this why is it left like that? Well, if it was just, the house just came down it and it they are back tomorrow, I don't know, it but may, that is it part may, of it. They have yeah. to bring it back to grade. Yeah. And I'll, 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 I will have a meeting tomorrow, tomorrow at 1.30 on a couple of other issues. Uh, the building department? Now yeah. this gets added on to the agenda. This is a friend of well, pretty much what I was going to say is um, been uh, demonstrated here with um, we have um, all the time we hear from residents <coughs> about what is the city doing about this burned out house. I wouldn't want to live next door uh, to it and, and I really empathize with the neighbors, especially when you're trying to maintain your property, maintain your curb appeal, and you've got this uh, eyesore. I mean, think about the one that was at the corner of uh, George Washington. I think it cornered Martha and, and George Washington. Um, that went on forever um, before that, you know, it, it right in the heart of, of Washington Heights. Um, so uh, I was thinking of this one, but I, I was also thinking about the one on Lois Lane because we ended up paying to demolish that house on Lois Lane. We didn't get any insurance <coughs> money. 
in this case, that this wouldn't wouldn't work on that one. But right. okay. I don't believe that house has a chair. So. Yeah. We have to wait till till it's sold before we get yeah. money back. Right. But now this this was a fire we had on uh, uh, Kenwick, and uh, this did have a basement under it, and uh, that house has been taken down. I didn't get a a, a good picture today of the uh, of the lot, but it is at grade. Uh, there's no hazard there. It's a nice vacant lot. Anything you know, obviously this is a significant problem. This is one year that we're only in the eighth month, and there are 63 houses here. This is a pretty big problem. Um, that, 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 and 11. Yeah, Mr. Shiver, that goes yeah. over. That, well, that actually goes, goes, goes back. Those are right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I messed on the summer. Yeah. Okay. This is still, 63 houses uh, it is a problem. Yeah. Uh, this was one we had on Red Maple. Uh, I was by the, I was by this house this morning. Uh, contractors were there, uh, but you can see the, the fire was back in March, and they've just gotten windows up into the second floor here. So it it is um, it does take them a long time. And this one may have had may have met the criteria, and, it, and they may have uh, sat on it for uh, quite a while before uh, before remodeling, or it may it may have been sold to an investor. Uh, which is happening a lot. They, they take the insurance money and, and turn these over to investors. Um, I have another, I think I may have another picture of one that uh, I stopped at and they were working on and, he, and the gentleman said he had just bought it and he's going to renovate it. And that was two months ago and it doesn't look that much different today. <coughs> so. This was on Thorndike. Um, this, this fire was back uh, in uh, August, almost a year ago now, and uh, this is what it looks like today. <coughs> Okay, now let's back into this. All right, let's say we have the fire withholding. We'd be holding a third of the proceeds. Okay, would that speed things up? Maybe. Well, well after, we, we after 120 actually, days, we can demolish it. You, you okay, have we right. could, or we could repair it. Or you can repair it and resell it. Correct. Okay, so, and so we could get action, at least into action early. We have to days. research the act further to find out the <laughs> legal and requirements. There's still, there's a lot. We would have to get a lot of legal. Oh yeah, we have to get a court order, right? Yeah. Right. There may be liens on the property. Mm -hmm. I think it would expedite the instance where someone's just going to take their money and walk away from it. Right. I think it, it does help us significantly. That's what we want to prevent. We don't, we don't like we said, it, it has its limitations, but it's something in the toolbox. That's right. If there's, you know. Well, everybody else seems to be just yeah, burning it out. <laughs> and you keep talking to people, so. I'm talking quietly. We can hear you down here. Yeah. Well, Mr. Sider, are you finished? Uh, yes, I am, and I, I did request to speak. I know you did request to speak. You're on the list. <laughs> and Ms. Jordan? Uh, thank you. Um, I think this is great that this presented to us uh, today. Uh, one question has to do with um, slide number 14, where the funds are not going to be released until it's prepared. So, can you clarify if it's sold, if the home is sold to somebody else and it's not repaired, do we still have access? If, if we had held on to those proceeds and it was sold, we would still hold on to those proceeds till we either go in and demolish it or force that new owner or he volunt they voluntarily make the repair. So the new owner the new owner would or would not know that the funds are in escrow. I would I not tell anything when it's recorded. Um, I it would the new, uh, well, we, we would hold those funds. So we, we would probably have an obligation to let them know um, that. I, 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 we would know because if they went to repair the structure, <coughs> they would have to go through the building and department, right. and that would trigger that would trigger this. It says the municipality is not obligated to release funds until a hazard the hazard is repaired, replaced, or demolished. The funds should be replaced, uh, or should be released to the insured at the time or the insured may uh, seek relief from the circuit court. That's if it's sold to a new owner. So, so the new rules apply. Can you give us a list here? Then we're going to do a retroactive way to go back. I thought about that earlier, especially on the first the first one we had, but I don't I don't think that's the case. I, we'll research it. We will, we will research it. You and I started talking about this in January. We were at that fire. No. Uh, we're in free. So, yeah. I think this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, 
I didn't have one. And um, Joanne? We have a breakdown of the, the uh, houses that are damaged by auction. We don't have that on the site. You don't have that? I don't have that on the site. We would have to go back into our uh, uh, our uh, uh, reporting program, and we we could look that information. You think out. some was damaged by often or burned out? Out of that many homes, I would imagine that huh. there were. Out of that many structures, I would imagine there's the uh, possibility that there's arson. That's an interesting number. Mm -hmm. You find that out, you get a good reading. <laughs> by percentage, not high. Not high. No. And it's hard to prove too. And I going to speculate with the statement, but I imagine the economy in the foreclosure crisis, is, and people are taking a lot more desperate measures, and perhaps unfortunately illegal measures. We have um, a, a, a list of foreclosures, and some of those homes are on that list also. They, they just let it go. They just, if they had a fire, they let it go. That's the way the economy and our <coughs> financial situation is right now is happening. Are they, uh, are they charged with arson? Are those, uh, uh, yes. <coughs> but we we, may, we make several arson arrests a year. It is a very difficult process. Is that available to us? How many arson arrests we make a year? Well, how many homes for burning? Yes, no arson. Yes, so I can give you that. I don't have it on me today. Well, I'm not asking. I have a number of fires, uh, um, no structure fires since the first of the year, uh, and then we'll, what we can do is break that down and, and uh, which ones were um, I think arson. You know. uh, <coughs> I think we've had 38 since the first of the year. 38, 38 working fires. Now that doesn't include a, a careless cook or, or a minor fire in a wastebasket. Those aren't, those aren't considered uh, working fires. Working fires are with a structural damage. Uh, heavy, heavy damage. Um, there's many, many fire runs we go on, uh, like I said, almost 1,700 a year that, that are, are put out before they, they get to any uh, large well, extent. The question. the question is how do they start? Well, how do they start? If they start uh, many, many different ways. We've had people that are uh, put candles in the in you know up in their bedroom and walk away and forget about them, or they leave a, leave a pot on the stove when they go to work. Uh, the the oven they have oven fires uh, grease they never clean their oven and the grease starts on in their oven. Um, uh, poor maintenance of dryer uh, vents uh, that'll that'll start a fire. Any any kind of cause that you can imagine uh, we run across. Electrical outlets that are improperly installed at home. That is an example of an arson fire. Uh, an arson fire is uh, a fire that's intentionally set. Or well, some knows that. Right. Um, okay, so you, you asked me what the definition is. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the definition is intentionally set fire. There are several different motives, Mr. Lance, for that, and one of them is to fraud the insurance company. That's probably the highest incidence of arson is to, to burn your stuff so that you can get out from under a large payment or so that you can cash in on a on an insurance policy. Yes, for an example. Okay. An example. example. Okay, so an example would be if, let's say, let me use a car fire as an example. Okay, let's say I buy a car, buy a Cadillac, it's a thousand dollar payment a month, and after a couple months I say I can't afford it anymore, so then I go ahead and I intentionally set my car, hope my insurance company's going to pay me off, and then I get out from under that large payment. That would be an example of an insurance policy. And how about a house? Well, I could, you mean examples of the way arson fires are set? Correct. Well, they, they, they use some really, uh, I mean, you know this most of the way. Is that what you're asking, Mr. Lance, how an arson fire gets started? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The most simple and easiest arson is to catch is someone that throws gasoline inside their house and throws a match on it. But there are more intricate ways of doing it, and uh, you know, they've gotten very sophisticated. But, you know, but it's very hard to prove. There are manuals and textbooks written on how to investigate mm -hmm. our suppliers. And okay. uh, Mr. Fisher. If uh, a fire is being contested, uh, the homeowner and insurance company can't agree on the settlement. 
so it goes to court. Uh, we're hands off until that is settled. Is that the? We'd be holding on to those insurance proceeds. Well, I uh, if no, if there's not a settlement, I don't think we can collect. I don't think we can. But we have the initial payment. Um, after, the, after a settlement is made is the way that the ordinance uh, the, uh, act reads. So there would have to be a settlement mm -hmm. and then because it's it's still uh, <coughs> discussion between the insured and the insurer. So we still have that 25%, you know, the 25% of the, the, the policy now sitting there. Right. Right. Update the $8,100. Okay. Yeah. For a, I, don't, I don't think that's no, correct. The insurance company doesn't settle. pay off. Uh, then there's no money laying on the table. Within 15 days afterwards, they have to put the money in, in, in our escrow account. Once the settlement is uh, agreed upon. Uh, okay. But then we can go to court, and we're a party to that. Yeah. Yeah. Try. I, I'm almost positive that if, uh, we can collect on the escrow account after a settlement has been agreed upon. So if it's contested, it just sets it, there. It sets there. And, yeah. We can't do anything about it. Yeah, they can hold it up. And, and I, I'm tell, I've had them contested, and we were holding on the money. Okay. And we were part of that okay. litigation. Like, twice was in court on that. Mm -hmm. So it seems, it sounds reasonable. Yeah. So you can get. So you can get the money. Uh, you're saying in Taylor. The insurance company paid off even even though it was contested. Correct. Hmm. And, and we were party to, I was in court on two, two different occasions for that. Um, so if it's, the other question I had was, if we think it ought to be torn down and the, uh, owner thinks it ought to be fixed but hasn't done anything about it, where do we go? After, yeah, after 120 days, if they haven't uh, signed a contract with a contractor, a licensed contractor, then you have the right to repair, demolish, uh, or remove the structure. But we'd have to get a court order to... Uh, it would be going through the court process. This really is a funding mechanism. Yeah. It's going to go through the same court process as it does now. Okay. So ultimately, we would, would if we make a case to the judge that this this structure needs to be demolished, the judge would order it, and then this would fund hopefully the demolition. Okay. If we felt that it was appropriate that it was just a repair, we would go through that route with the judge and have an order. So that we have a right to go on the property, do the work, and then this funds it. Okay. And if if we decide to tear it down, and it costs more than the eighty-one hundred and twenty-five dollars to tear it down. Do we get the difference between that and in the ultimate settlement? We would do the same thing that we're doing now, which is we bill it as a single lot special assessment for the demo, whatever we put in. So we it. get it when it's sold. Right. We get it in the next when we get reimbursed by the county for the taxes. Okay. We get the it then. Between. The problem is, and what we're experiencing now. Ultimately, people stop paying taxes on these properties, so it goes through the forfeiture process of the county, and the statute for those forfeiture proceedings expressly provides that all the demolition that the cities have, they're wiped out. Those liens are wiped out. So if it goes through that process, we get wiped out, okay. and that and that's a, a serious problem with the way the statute's worded. Except we'll be ahead by 8100. We would at least be ahead by 81, which yeah. is more than we're ahead yeah, now. Yeah, right. right. Because you know? we've got the money right now. Yeah, we're paying the whole thing right yeah. now. Okay. And that has been discussed by lobbyists, and we'd like to see that discussed by legislative. Just we like do. Those liens should not week, be wiped out. If they, if we could, if there could be a way that the lien wasn't wiped out, I just want to add one statement. So correct me if I'm wrong. We still need a court order to put that single set. We get a the court it's grants us the ability yeah. to put that assessment on the property. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On the list, you have a number of apartment or condos. You can't demolish them. So what is what? How would this affect apartment or condos? 
Well, the, the apartments, I, I think they usually, because the, uh, the apartment owner usually wants to uh, take, care of that take care of that right away so they can get a renter in there. Though most of those are condominiums, and they are very similar to a, a residential structure, individual residential structure. It's up to the homeowner. Now, the condo association may have their bylaws <coughs> that require uh, a certain time. Um, the I'm, I, I'm pretty I'm just sure curious if this would even apply to a condo purchase because the flexibility between the association and just the inherent um, structure does not allow for demolition. So that's correct. Yeah, so I would think that this wouldn't even apply. It may apply in the, 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 in the renovation <laughs> portion. Of it. it probably it would, but there's still an insurance and the mechanism would be the same thing. Well, the demolition piece would be right. if, if you had, for example, a condominium of four units, and it was beyond that 49 percent threshold, that's right. it, it may still apply. I've never, I've, I've had experience with apartments, but never a condo, so I don't have any first-hand experience. And, and one individual condo out of the four, yes, they may not demolish the whole structure, but if, but if they have over 49 percent damage in the, you know, a combination of all four, yes, it would, I, I believe it would fall under, under this act. So the entire building was damaged, but not the single unit. And then it may fall under the commercial, uh, the commercial portion where we have what, 25 percent and there's no maximum. I'm just wondering who's going to um, administer this program? Are we saying the building department? Are we going to say, um, because that's a, a huge red flag. The building department right now um, appears to have a handful. I don't see the private housing department having this responsibility. Who's going to administer it? I understand the financial part goes through the treasurer, but who is going to be responsible? Because if we are renovating it, then you have contractors, you have all those things that we're going through now with NHP or whatever, and I'm just really concerned. Who's going to administer it? And have we thought that through? The answer is there, there has been some, some thought to it, Mayor. We haven't finalized. Uh, it's probably a combination of fire marshal working with the building department. That the building department initiates those legal actions now. They do the testimony when a building is beyond repair. That's the group who's who have the credentials to make those those statements. And between a fire marshal and a building official, it's not going to be someone in the housing department, which for the most part administers federal programs and doesn't re doesn't cover building regulations. It's going to be someone who has those credentials. It, it would be the building department. Um, working with the fire department. So if we if we adopt this program, then um, it shortens the period of time because we have this is a two year period, three year, four year period. So can you tell me, like the house, Providence Drive is with this 08. If we have a number of tens on here, why are the tens? I hear timelines being pushed back now because of limitations in the building. So if we're going to fast track this through, because it'll, it'll become available sooner, and we'll be able to interact. So if a house like this, it looks like we could say, I don't know, because it's a brick structure, it looks like you could gut it out and the roof seems to be intact. So a house like this, are we going to be then responsible for a home, the repair of it, getting the contractors, and putting it back on the market? It, it would, I, I would imagine it would depend on if the city determined that this is the homeowner walked away and it's not a bank-owned home. If it's a bank-owned home, they're going to have first lien on it. Okay. Um, but I would imagine if the city determined that they wanted to renovate this home, then we would have to develop some kind of procedure for for moving that along, uh, some kind of general uh, contract or auto But most of these, this one may be a foreclosed home that the, the homeowner just walked away from. It may be a bank home. Bank home. Um, and 
it may, this one may not have even met the criteria. Uh, it may have had a, a, living, a living room fire here. Uh, windows may have been broken out for ventilation, and this may, may just have been a 20% damage to the home, which would not meet the criteria of this uh, act. Uh, this, this, this is my concern. I want it thought through, and, and counsel, it sounds great. But then we're going to get to the point, then we're going to start getting calls. Well, the city has the property. How long does it take? And we get those kind of calls all the time now. And so then it puts us in the position of production, and we, we're owning a blight if we can't respond in a timely manner. So I just want it thought through and, and how, how we can do this, because right now with the homes we own in NHP, I mean NHP, NSP. NSP. That's become an issue because we have our own internal processes and delays in federal government, whatever. But to me, for us to be responsible for eliminating blight, and we're going to the home ownership piece, and then we are we are not because we just don't have the capability. We don't. We just don't have the built-in capability to continue to add on to our building department. And you all know when you're renovating a home, we've been through that. What is details? Yeah, I, uh, uh, this doesn't give us possession of the home. It just gives us uh, some ability some leverage to, to recover if the home is not going to be repaired. So if there's a demolition, we're okay. insured. We're we're able to get at least a piece of what That's the right. cost would be. In fact. Probably a substantial piece. But this program also gives us the flexibility to rehab as well, right? No. It said, it said it this does program. not put us in the contractor's position. This is simply to, for us to get our hands on a piece of the insurance proceeds, put them in an account in case the owner of the building does not undertake the necessary repairs. If the owner of the building undertakes the necessary repairs, then there's no issue. They get the money back, and they, you know, they, they proceed along. They have to so get the permits. So again, when we take over, <coughs> we manage this from our number one objective would be stimulus. Well, you yeah, say stimulus. I would say that is true. For the most part, and that right. that puts me at ease because there is an opportunity in here. From what I read, is that the home could be rehabbed, and it could be put back on the market. Like you said, this house is totally demolished. I don't know what the percentage is. And if that is the case, we just need to work it and not end up in a position where we're asking the questions at the end of the game. We should know ahead of time what their workload would be, who would be responsible, and so that we would have some expectation of how it's being handled. I would say, too, most of the homes that are 49% or better for damage will get demolished. That's probably why they chose that 39% figure. Okay. And with or without this act, we still have this obligation. The building department is taking these two parts, and every one of these, there's a story. When you go through address by address with the building department and the fire department, there's a reason why something is moving, is it moving forward. And a lot of it lies in the courts. If, if you go in front of a judge and you're, you're asking for something, Your Honor, I'm getting bids and asking this, I'm asking for a continuation, almost always granted. <coughs> Monthly, we get a report of it. So you still have that obligation, with or without this act. It only strengthens the city's position to withhold these insurance proceeds. Are the number of these homes um, <coughs> yes. is it is this like one of the highest we've had? Yes. And I would say it's increasing simply because there's more vacant houses. The majority of these were vacant before. No, I'm not saying they were vacant before, the but there is a good portion of them that were, yes. Is that where you're seeing the increase? Yes. More vacant fires mean bigger fires, and uh, means more arson. Right. Okay. Did you say arson? Yes. Okay. Are you finished, Ms. Wong? Um, Mr. Lance, you want to move? Yeah. Um, does anybody know? Fire on 12 mile office building last year. Yes. 
and would we want to live next door to a house that's not 49 percent here, but still is in disrepair? And so when we look at when we look at all these, we really do need to take all of that into consideration. That if we're really concerned about curb appeal and um, improving our neighborhoods, all of these things need to be addressed. I'm in favor of going forward with this. I think that, as the administrator said, it's just another tool that we have available to us. And uh, I do agree with uh, those who spoke and addressing each and every one and try to find out where its status is today. I think we have to do more than have a consensus. That's well, it's going to come up on the August 27th regular meeting. Yeah, I'm going to Okay. That's, that's what if that's what the decision is, then I have to, I consent to, to move it forward. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Who do we see that up here? Who do we, uh, I guess, to Mr. Schwab, how can we get each one of these brought up to to current, whether it's in court, or I guess 2007, 2008? Yeah, bring it up to current yeah, status. Yeah, we'll, we will provide a status on this. Okay, uh, so the next item is we, um, for complex policy. Recently, we had a request from an outside um, firm based in uh, Oklahoma requesting to use our front lawn for a large event. And uh, this brought to our attention the um, fact that we may want to consider having a policy to um, perhaps limit it to our own uses. So um, that's why this is on the agenda.
I've been thinking about this, and uh, to have a hard rule that um, only city-sponsored events on the front lawn kind of troubles me only because we've had some great things on the front lawn. I mean, the jazz concert with an adult crowd, we didn't have teens roaming and all that kind of stuff. Those were beautiful evenings. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, my thought was that, well, maybe... Um, this doesn't preclude that. Well, that's what I was trying to say, that, that we would, um, you know, for instance, the one that's before us, um, if we chose not to, uh, I, I think you have to weigh them on individual merit, but um, if we granted the front lawn usage, then it would be um, the, the city sponsorship to some degree. Uh, but that does not mean that we're paying for security or parks and rec staff or anything else. That would be in whatever contract that that is developed. I think I think we need a little latitude. Because we we have had um, you know one of the greatest as far as I was concerned was the circus um, mm -hmm. when we had that up here. Um, I just thought that was the greatest event. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I know Mr. Moss had his hand up, but let me say this: you know what's happening is that those things are fine, but we have now gone beyond, say for example, uh, you want to have an ethnic festival or an international festival out in front. You know, then it expands into a money-making circus or carnival. And I really object to, to that. Uh, you know, we, I mean, I just don't think that the carnival, <coughs> and I go way back when we used to be on the school property at yeah. Southfield Road and, and Ten Mile Road, and there used to be a service club event, and it was the, we had Jeannie McDonald and the Voice of the Fair and all that, but it was kind of a piece of vacant land that was the city and uh, schools that we used, the ball field. But when you use the front lawn, it puts, to me, carnival atmosphere. I mean, we've got, we've got residents now in this area. You know, to the south, to the north, we've got <coughs> over 5,000 have to look at this. I mean, I think that that is truly intrusion for business, and I don't think that the front lawn should be used for kind of a business. It should be for the community, a business community, to enjoy an evening event co-sponsored by Park Street. Then I, then I don't I think disagree that with you. I just. Um which is troubling to me with some hard fast rules. Um, so that we wouldn't preclude something really nice coming along. Um, you know, uh, we were all excited about Little Caesars uh, and, that, and that kind of partnership, um, which isn't the same thing. But it, the parallel I'm trying to draw is that um, I think you have to allow a certain amount of um, individual, the merit of the individual event, uh, or, or the, the event, the proposed event. Um, I'm not impressed with this one. No, uh, I'm not at all. Um, but, but, but at the same time, I'll be very candid. You know, individuals come and, and, and give me a call, you will call, whoever will call, mm -hmm. and I need your vote, put political pressure on you to approve the front lawn for their little party, and and I really object to that, and 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 so that is why, you know, I think it's important to be on the agenda today is because we have to have some guidelines, and and no, we don't want to have a tight, you know, restrictive, a policy on, on it. We should have some latitude to make the change whenever we feel it's really in the best interest of the community. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I don't want it to be grown into something that is, is uh, something that is not in keeping with, I think, the, the respect of the community and the front lawn. I don't have an argument with that. Six, six more stream was employed by exactly. that's, a, that's a circus came, we, the city wanted that, everybody wanted that. 
because there are some jazz venues that are coming back up where they would be able to do it. Would I want that in our city? Absolutely. But if we adopt a philosophy like that, we again, you know, we push away venues because we have this 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 image that nothing should happen in the city. And most of our events are children, family events that happen on the lot. But there are young people, there are adults and seniors that want events for them. You know, we're gonna have the the <coughs> the hold down picnic. That's a limited event. We have um even our events inside the pavilion have shrunk. We have some diehards. We've lost some of them. We have some diehard antique events. We don't have that many. We we still have the gym show. But we are not, for us to be the center of it all, we have not embraced how we market this city for public, entertaining events. And that pavilion is such a lost opportunity for revenue. It is unbelievable because there's not that many venues that can actually house what we have right here. We keep talking about revenue. My philosophy is, is that the council has independently reviewed these things as they come up. And if it's a no, it's a no. But I am very concerned that we take an event that happened in Northland and use that as a gauge to shut down everything else in the city. That's not fair. That's not being objective. And that's not embracing People like coming to the city. Ethnic groups love coming to South because we have created an environment where everybody is welcome. The Indian groups, the the, uh, the African groups, the uh, the Caribbean groups, uh, just all these different groups. They come to South so They don't feel like they'll be discriminated against. They feel welcome, and we have done that. But now we're saying because if we initiate this the fast and hard policy, the Caribbean festival is gone. That's done by the Chamber of Commerce. That's not really a... Why do we care if they make money? They're paying to use the line. It's what it costs us because it takes staff away from things they are. They need to be doing to, to service us. This doesn't but don't we charge them for that? Mm -hmm. no, no. 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 Why don't we charge them? We charge for city expenses. We don't charge for use of the lawn. I don't want to pay. So pay, charge for the use of the water. No, none of these other groups have come to us and asked to have If the jazz stuff come back, they'd be welcome. We'd love to have the jazz stuff back. But then you're picking Yeah, that's choosing. picking and choosing, too. No, it isn't. But, but wait a minute. Why shouldn't we pick and choose? Why? This is our front lawn. Why shouldn't we pick and choose who can use it? Why not tell us up home and say, yeah, they can come in and and tear it all up and raise Why are you so many will tear it up? Well, I'm just, I'm not. Why are you saying? making that Because of the volume. They're, they want to raise, it's fundraising. They want to go around and raise money. I'm just saying, if we don't have control, if we're going to rent out the front lawn, then it's open to everybody. And are we going to rent out the front lawn, or is it going to be a beautiful setting, let the kids come in here and play, pick up with whatever they play, play the mm -hmm. Are we going to preserve it as a beautiful site that we can use it as we want to, or are we going to just say it's for rent to everybody? Does the Frisbee people that come out here every Monday, do they pay to use them on? No. And we welcome that. And they take a lot of parking space and somebody needs to tell us how to do it. We're going to do something about the cars. We're not, we are going to do something about the cars. But, but I mean, it's, we have defined what we think is acceptable. And it's being elitist to some point. And I understand we don't want problems. There are some of us who are sick and we don't have fireworks. There's others like, yay, now we don't have to deal with those people. We don't have fireworks. I mean, it's... It gets to the point, you know, especially young families, they like community. Even Birmingham opens up their city park and allows people to use it. And there are definitely people living downtown in Birmingham. We're not saying that we're never going to use it. We're, we are just saying we're not going to let everybody who wants to use it use it. It's well, we way. don't do that now. And, and I, understand, I understand clearly what Councilman Jordan is saying, because if we're picking and choosing, you know, just knowing the, the makeup of this council, you're going to fix certain events and certain groups that you're going <coughs> to and the other one, you're going to inherently say, no, we don't want that group here. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. I understand what she's saying. But I think it's a missed opportunity for us to just, right now at 10 o'clock, you can't do anything in the city of Southfield. 
it's it's pretty much shut down. You can't get food unless you want McDonald's or whatever. And some folks are happy with that. But when people constantly, and we keep saying it, you constantly have to leave the city to go get the things that you want. You move to the city that has those those uh, venues and services that you want. And I think there's a happy medium between here. I understand what, but I, I just don't want it to shut down. I mean, what benefit is that? When we have the jazz festival, did you hear one negative thing? And I no, don't think they, they stopped coming here. We love the jazz festival. Coming here. But we have other people that are asking to come. I just, I just think it's short-sighted, and I think we really need to embrace what we want our city to be. I don't think we're turning down anybody. I'm, I'm just, that's my opinion. My other, um, my other comment is, rather than promoting the front lawn, can we promote the space right behind? Okay, does anybody want to come? That's unusable. We don't. Oh, you mean, uh, like, you mean the plaza out there? Yeah, yeah. I think that, that is, is a perfect venue. Uh, a great person where people can yeah. have events. Yeah. Because you could put one of those outdoor tents over that, mm -hmm. and it would be that. perfect. Family reunions. That's not what we're talking about. I know, I know. That's not what we're talking yeah. about, but I think you yeah. yeah. can this uh, discussion in the future. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess maybe there's confusion on my own part mm -hmm. about the process by which we move forward. Because when I say pick and choose, you know, I, if it's not realistic, it, you know, I, if it's not something that the city can handle, then it comes to a vote of the council and, and we express our concerns directly. But at some point, somebody's picking and choosing, whether it's directed directly to Parks and Rec. And I feel like if it's directed towards Parks and Rec, then it's based on a, a what the Parks and Rec staff can handle, what the Parks and Rec budget can handle. And like the mayor said, we'd be missing opportunities to partner with outside organizations to allow them to take the brunt of the cost of a lot of different, more fun and exciting events. I, I, think, it's, I think it goes back to that sense of place. You know, if the city drives the same events year in and year out, which, you know, to me as a, as a, as a young person without kids, <coughs> all a certain demographic, it's just more family oriented, we're not really creating a sense of place for anybody uh, who works in these buildings but doesn't live in the city of Southfield. You know, you know we wouldn't, we, I think it's a good thing to have the front lawn as the most visible event place in the city. You work here, and uh, you're a young person who lives in the area, and you're going to come down uh, from 5 o'clock, you get off work, and there's an event going on right outside. I mean, this is a huge asset. I, I don't see it as, as, as desecrating the front lawn. Uh, I think it's, if there's something that presents it to the city, rather than driving it to Parks and Rec, uh, for, uh, well, if the city can't fully partner, you know, we're not going to do it, rather than coming to the council and presenting the case that we way. You understand that when the Chaldean Festival came, that the council had to approve it. Right. All right, so those kinds of things, if somebody comes in, that doesn't mean the council isn't going to look at it. It's not, we're not leaving everything to Parks and Rec to say only they can use it. I think you're misunderstanding. Maybe I am. Yeah, what are we doing? That, uh, maybe I am. What, are, what is this? So let's say, let's say kinfolk come with, with the idea. But let's say we pass something that, that, that is, is kind of a more structured policy. Where do these kinfolks go? Uh, let me, I can Where do they go? Yeah. Yeah. If you that, if we do what you're asking, what, 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 what would let's say we pass this tonight as as, as you envision it. And again, I'm not insulting. I I'm seriously trying to just push it so we're at a place. So we we pass it with the with the with the idea that you know it's more city initiated events. What would these What's the process by which Kinfolk Soul Food Music Fest would go through the city to get to get it done? Um, they probably wouldn't. I mean, these people. That's my point. Yeah. I mean, I think where we're trying to go is, um, you know, I said I don't want, I, I'm concerned about a hard, fast rule because there may be opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, it doesn't preclude that. But I didn't hear from your thinking how it doesn't preclude that. Um, so maybe you need to explain that. Well, I mean, this, the recommendation is coming from the city administrator that we need to have a policy. We 
need to have some control. It isn't all just, we, I think we do have some control now, but we have events come in here that are attracting, and we've had this with the fireworks groups that take a lot of control, a lot of police control. We're, we're taking our staff to do things to set it up to work with people like the Caldean Festival. When they, we know we're getting smaller, we're having fewer people to, we're looking at the future. We've got fewer people to deal with these. And I understand that, and honestly, uh, I'm ready to cancel any event that you have to put tons of security out, mm -hmm. then, then to me it's the antithesis of a community event. When you have an armed state out front to, to for crowd control, then it's not worth it. That's why uh, the school ethnic festivals stopped, because the amount of security that was needed, it was the antithesis of what, what a, a family, food, uh, and cultural night was supposed to be. Um, so but it's getting to that point. That's the problem. I understand that. But you still haven't, at least to me, answered the question, um, how do you not preclude a hard and fast? I, 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 that's what I'm looking for. I don't understand that part of it. But you're not answering. Well, I, 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 I'm don't, I don't think, I don't, I mean, we're not saying we're never going to have events there. We're not saying no events there. That's, uh, that's not what this is. That's the way I understood it. Okay, somebody wants to come along and do something, and it, but if Parks and Rec says, no, we don't want to touch it. So does it happen under your... Well, I'm just trying to understand it. It's not, I'm not arguing with you, but it's not clear to me how, how we don't preclude if we have this rule it has to come out of Parks and Rec. We didn't say it had to come out of Parks and Rec. We said city initiated or city and or city, I guess city initiated and city sponsored. City initiated does it. Oh, what Parks and Rec? There's, there's the, thing, the things that the member um, of Rosenthal's department can put on, like we have the International Festival here. Library or? Yeah, library, whatever. some of these events. It's not just what Parks and Rec, it's not just their okay. use of the front lawn. That's but those are city initiated. Well, they do certain things here, and that's fine, but it's, it's not just what Parks and Rec wants to do. That's not at all. That's not at all. You know, anybody else did I? All right. I, I, I see here, well, I see here, <coughs> walk into a restaurant, and you've got all the ball hog, yeah. and it's limited by how many people can fit in the ball hog, or a restaurant. Or a ballroom, or our room. That's where that's where we should go. Depending upon how many can fit on our front lawn, if we have room for them, and if we don't, it's just we don't. But also, what what we're doing with the crowd control? What kind of? I mean, that all interesting to it. How much do we need? What do we need to keep all of that entertainment? Mm -hmm. May I ask this? Why, why, why don't we charge for what we need? So, say for instance, Kim, Kim folks, whoever they are, if they come in and say, "Sydney, you don't have to pay anything. Tell me how much it'll cost for us to have this event on your front lawn. How many police I have to pay for? Give me a charge. I'll pay." It. The city doesn't have to do anything. I'm really concerned when you say the city is doing all this thing because they charge for garbage pickup. They charge for the police. When that contract for the Chaldeans, they, I wasn't aware of them getting anything free because they're paying overtime hours for police. They had to pay for garbage pickup, even though they wanted to have their own security and whatever. Right, and they so, wanted private the police. The police. And we and said no. Right. We, we said no. For the, for the event that happened that disrupted everything and caused our police to work overtime, they didn't pay for that. They refuse to but see, look at the staff. Even though it's being paid for, staff is going to work for an outside event instead of doing things that we need. To. We're getting smaller. We're getting less. So why staff. do we, why do we force staff to do that? They have to. Who's no, going to restore no, the No, on? if you there's events all the time. In other words, you can, can hire waste management we to pick up trash. We can hire. We can tell them hire all your own people to bring to everything that has to be done. They have to pay for everything. They have to restore the grass. But what you need to realize is that that happens every day in the world. 
that this events is a happen. Nice plan. This is but listen, we act like if we have an event, it has to be, and that's been my my complaint is that I understand fire and I understand police, EMS, but we have to have our people every time we have an event. We we have our staff out there picking up the trash. Why can't you have make them pay somebody to pick it up, and if they don't, we'll use our people in charge. Or they can't have the event. Or they can't have we the event. Our people, if we have to use our people, we're going to pay overtime. So don't use our people. But that doesn't always work. It's easier said than done. Well, I want to get a consensus. Don, do you want to have a call? I'd like to say something. Well, this is on what? Well, that's what I'm trying to I find mean, out. Let, let, me, let me get back to, to uh, what is the city? The mayor said, what is the city? And and. And I guess maybe we should be fine with the city is. And that's the city the front is not. Line. Well, it, it, what happens in front lawn is not a fairgrounds. It it was a front yard of the city hall, and we used to be off site with our events until that was turned off, and then it was brought here by the cultural arts people, and we had culture arts festival here, all done by. Mr. Schmidt and, and Mrs. Hollander, and, and it was just a grandiose, beautiful thing. Tents were back here. There were all kinds of art exhibits and everything else. We had outdoor sculpture here. What's happened is that, and 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 you know, and what we did when we when we to get into this, when you put the library on this site, you shortened the amount of space that you have for the front yard. So when you curtail the space, then you also curtail the activities. But we didn't curtail the activities. We went on and continued the activities as if we had the whole front lawn to deal with. And I mean, we used to have the mud things over there on the other side by the tennis courts. We used to have a hockey rink over there. I mean, there was so many things that the front lawn was used for for the community. And, and, and so we went off site with, with the polo. It was the most magnificent, internationally known thing was happening. It was a class thing, and 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 when we, when Don Scotus came up for for sale, you know they didn't want to pay. The city council voted down buying it, and they picked this site to build the library. Now, so <coughs> now you have limited amount of space for events, and as far as restaurants, what kind of events? Would you draw to have the enough commercial residents, uh, <coughs> businesses, restaurants to come into the area to be supported by the events you have? So if you have to decide that this is going to be uh, all the events can be on the front lawn, then you have to have a downtown somewhere so that you can make the whole atmosphere change. You know, I mean, but you can't just say, oh, this weekend we're going to have this festival, and we're going to use the front lawn. It, it's got to be a place for events, and and then you have to have the the surrounding to house the events, to support the events. You have to have the ability to understand the cost of it, and and if there are costs, who's going to pay the cost? But we don't do that. We we bring a group in here and and okay it. Then all of a sudden we got to figure out. How many police do we need? How many public works people? And how many of this? How many of that? Who can do the pickup? We don't have charges. We don't say, well, if you want rubbish picked up, this is your price. If you want security, this is your price. And, and, and you know, it's a limited amount of space. And look for what we've done. We went from a festival on the front lawn to now having a festival on Evergreen Road. Not knocking who is it, but I mean, we've expanded it. So what is it? Next week we're going to go across the street to Farmroy property, and we're going to make a deal with them. So now we're going to make a big thing go all the way down Civic Center Drive. You know, they close off Evergreen Road, level it. It, it looks crazy, you know, bad anyway. You want to buy the level it. You have a big front lawn all the way down Civic Center Drive, and then have have a fairgrounds. Now that, that you're being silly, but I mean you only have so much space. And you keep limiting the amount of space. Where's the parking? We don't even have a parking deck. As much as I try to get a parking deck over here at the south end so that we had 
because my wife was an antique dealer and she had a show here, they couldn't even, they can't even unload out here because they can't park on, on the patio because it doesn't hold the trailers, the weight. I mean, we everything we have done, we have curtailed the uses mm -hmm. that we have brought to this area. Instead of making things because of cost. Iman says, you know, we can't afford two million dollars to redo the surface of the plaza. Okay, so we're going to put patio so down so you can creak as you walk. Okay, so then we have now that, but you can't put trailers on that. You can't put the weight of the vendors on that. And so now they back up all the way back here. And, and that's why it's being curtailed. They're very unhappy with even that. So they, when you bring events here, you got to have parking. And we don't have parking. If you have the library going, you, you, you don't even conform to what you would ask a business to conform to. You do not have, it, it, actually, your non-conforming use. And you made this whole site non-conforming <coughs> use. And, and so you say, well, let's have a big party. Well, you know, how do you have it when, when you don't have the, the space for it? And, and so I have to, that's the only reason I think you have to have a policy is because you're expanding something that, that shouldn't be expanded. And if you want to expand it, then, then expand, close off Evergreen Road, make, make Central Park Boulevard our westerly road and have Evergreen go around or whatever you have and you enlarge it and have events and have restaurants around it or whatever. But you have to have a plan for what we're talking about. Instead, we just try to make do with something that is just, I, to me, a bad situation. Okay, this is a recommendation from the city administrator that we, the council adopts the policy limiting the use of the municipal complex front lawn only to events initiated by the city council. This is not my plan. This is because of something <coughs> that came up <coughs> kind of to a head, and this is, I think you all got the copy of this case. Is this resolution something you can support, Tom? Well, I want to consider some of the things that were raised <coughs> at the table. Okay. Acknowledge those things that I think we have to clarify more what kind of events we're going to have. And, and by the, by what kind of events and you how know, they have a cost factor put into place so that whatever that group needs there be a cost factor to it and, and that it be limited to the amount of space that we have to provide. Don't and, we do that and, now? And we don't, pardon? Don't we do that now? We don't have that price. No, we negotiate. Matter of fact, the one group who didn't pay us for a whole year right. after and they came back for another. Right. That not to mention names, but I mean, but we're not running it right. as a business. Right. And and everything that we do, I think every policy we make is the, has to be <coughs> very business like. And I agree mm -hmm. with with Ken. You know, if if something comes in and it's a community type thing and it's a nice draw and it's a nice entertainment, there's no reason why we can't support it. I totally agree but, with that. But, but that is very subjective. It's subjective. That's very subjective. But, but, but what happens is, but what That's happens, very subjective. but what happens is that you have costs. So you can go ahead, you have so much space. I mean, it, like, what do you mean subjective? I mean, well, I don't understand it's, it's, what it's, you say. You, you subjective. Said, you said it's good for the family. No, no, I just say that it's good for the community. Good for the Chaldean Festival is good for the community. It doesn't it's sit on the front lawn. The it doesn't sit on the front lawn. Can't say but it doesn't sit on the front lawn. But it's already flooding overboard. It's like having a pond and all of a sudden you have a flood. You've got to make I don't think this can be solved tonight. Oh, no, I, mean, I, mean, I think there's a lot more work that has to be done on it. has to be But it can't be subjective, Don, because what you think is good for the family is different from what I think is good for the family. And we well, make it, and we, and we compromise, right? Yeah. We, don't we have a discussion <laughs> over it. I mean, I, I don't know where you're coming from, and maybe you can no, explain I more. I explained it. What? The, the, the Chaldean Festival, some people would say that's good for the family. This is a soul food. But it doesn't Some sit. But it doesn't sit on the front lawn. That doesn't. 
You read the, the comments about that. People are parked for uh, miles and miles, can't even get to it. You think that can, you can house that kind of a no. facility on the front lawn? They're not even a local. They're not even a local. Yeah, but I'm just talking well, about I'm just saying how it, it, it can't be projected. It has to be. Well, every day I get up, I make choices. Well, let's well, I just wanted to add something else. We used to have the Humane Society have their annual festival on the front lawn. They, to my understanding, because they're a nonprofit, I don't know what the city did to that, but they're self-contained. They set up. They shut down. We used to have the Heart Walk, which was the largest event. And they moved. To the they moved. And we are. That was a lot of positive publicity so for us, both them of them. They moved to their own place. On their own. We did shut them off. But those were not city initiated events. And if we had a policy that it only had to be city initiated, as nice as those events were and as positive, they will not happen. It doesn't mean just things that are. That's what that says. Well, we, what okay, we're voting well on something that says that. Initiated, but that doesn't mean <coughs> just the parks and recreation, like the some more. It doesn't mean that. So what, what does it mean? Through but it's 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 go ahead. Through the chair, it's, uh, I'm going to try some wordsmithing here. I'm listening to this. It's a good, it's a good debate. Uh, let's try. Let's just try this. It works. Uh, the, in the second line, the resolve only to events instead of initiated, sponsored by the city itself. You know to be initiated through parks and recreation or community relations. And then have, you know, so you have a system. Mm -hmm. the final appeal to decisions by parks and recreation or community relations is city council. Is mm -hmm. okay. so that way, mm -hmm. that way it goes through the system, parks and recreation or community relations, mm -hmm. depending on what type of event, most of the time it's going to be parks and recreation. Mm -hmm. Well, the library had an event on the yeah. lawn. So we could say it would be initiated, initiated through the appropriate to the department. So yeah. it gets back to the Chaldean <coughs> so That would not happen again because it's not initiated. It's initiated no, by. We're changing words here. No. Just sponsored. Then sponsored by the city of Southfield. But let's, let's say we didn't have a Chaldean festival. We're starting all over. And let's say they came to us. They would come through an appropriate department, which would be Parks and Recreation. Our front lawn is going to be Parks and Recreation. Period. Okay. And let's say Parks and Recreation said no. Okay. Give all their reasons. They have a whole, they have a whole protocol. They go through, make their decision, and then if the if that group wants to make an appeal to the Parks and Rec decision, they come and come to. Is it to the board? Parks and Recreation. Exactly. No. Why can't you go to the board and then you come back? No. Because those are residents. Exactly. And that's the same point I was going to bring up. So we do not use our board in there. But this is the other thing. It gets back to what Don said. We have to run it like a business. There has to be a reason for Parks and Rec to say no. Exactly. We have size, and you know, it shouldn't be, well, it costs the city too much money. We don't know what too much money is because every group that comes. And then we, if, and then this is, this is the, the challenging part about that. They'll say, well, you have to hire six and a half police. And they'll come and say, well, we'll hire our own private security. No, that's not good enough. You've got to hire six and a half police, and we want them to sit on the property while your event is happening and you pay them overtime to do that. To me, it's with us having less police officers, I don't get that. I just really don't get that. But if that's our policy, that's our policy. But then it should be a dollar amount that everybody sees as a business. Just like if you come to the pavilion, there's a charge for AV, there's a charge for setup, there's a charge for whatever, and we don't pick and choose unless I think we don't do some type of concert. But if you go on and go to our parks, we don't say, what is your use? Who is your people? What are you going to do with it? You pay a fee, you rent the park. There are some guidelines, but you just pay a fee. We don't get into who are you, who's your base going to be, 
are we going to make some money off of you? We have a fee. That's the price you pay to rent our park. And we need to get to that point so it's not subjective. If you're gonna, because you now you have Parks and Rec saying, no, Ken, folks, you can't come. We don't think you're a good youth. But, oh, the poker team, we like you, so you can come and you can use it. If the Frisbee people wanted to have their national conference on that front line, that's a good use. And I don't like that. Make a plan. I mean, Don, Don said it clearly. We should run it as a business. If we're going to get to this point where we have a policy, what does, what does it cost to have an event? What is the limitation of people? If your event is over, because I think the jazz festival, they went up to 5,000. So we didn't have it out in the street. I, I don't, I'm not talking about the street. The jazz festival was getting 5,000. So what is the number? <laughs> but what is the number? I'm not debating the number. You should have a business plan that this is what can be, and if we want to limit it so it doesn't go in evergreen, but we know for a fact that's what we'll prove. It needs to be more professional, not so subjective. Well, right now our policy is that we
That's, that's not what. Now. That's not what. That's, I guess that's not how I'm well, trying to present my argument. You, you, know, you just don't want the little kids. You, you're no, that's, that's not it. Kids that, that's not. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying. So what else have they done? That's not what we're talking about. That's what I want to talk about. That's where I want the conversation to go. I think if we say we're going to restrict the front lawn, then we've got to give an alternative to other places in the city that are going to be held. So we're going to say no to the front lawn, but I think we've got to give the other organizations that come in. No, you can't move our front lawn, but you can go over to Pebble Creek, or you can go over to... We've got to be open to give other places that... Yes, I think there's a misunderstanding, because the only thing that we ourselves put on, that's not the way I see it. No, what I'm saying is, if there are other groups that's going to come in, and we're not going to... That are not compatible with what we're going to do. Well, then it's up to them to find a place. It is, but we should be willing to say, no, you can't go here. But think about this part of the city, because it's still going to help all the residents of the city. But it's not always residents, it's outside groups that come in. And that's not a bad thing. I think we should want to be a city that attracts... I'm okay that we're... We don't have the Riverside. We don't have what Detroit has, where we can have these huge groups coming in. I'll give you... No, I'll say it. Birmingham, St. Park, is that... The most exciting event that I've kind of been to in Southfield was the Jazz Fest. And if we could do something comparable to that and have an organization come in, obviously that jazz station doesn't exist anymore. What I see is if there's an organization that comes in and says, we want to have a jazz fest or whatever, and it really could be Tin Rod or Tin Folk, if they say that they want to have a jazz fest, basically what I'm hearing is that if the city can't partner, if the city can't put up some control measures, then obviously the conversation is completely off the table, regardless of whether or not the fact that they would pay for it. No, I think we should say... That's what I'm hearing. We can't use the front lawn, but we've got some place else that you can use. Oh, I mean, I don't have a problem with the front lawn. Let's see how this would work, though. So we have the other process. So let's take this through. Here's what happens. Here's what would happen under this suggestion. They come to Parks and Recreation. Parks and Recreation meets a protocol, make a decision. Okay? Parks and Recreation let council know we have been approached by such and such a group. Okay? Here's our decision. Basically a paragraph or two why. Okay? A list of reasons why. And then if that group says, I want to appeal, they can appeal to City Council. So City Council will have the decision why it was made. We have somebody here from Parks and Recreation to explain the decision. And the appeal will be here. So at least you have a process. Right now, it's kind of like this group, for example, sent an email to Rochelle Freeman. Okay? Well, there's nothing wrong with that because they don't know who to contact. Okay? So you have a list of reasons why you want to appeal. Okay? So you have a rule and a procedure. Say, okay, contact Parks and Recreation. Okay? Well, that's what we're doing. Recreation has to make a decision. Whatever the protocol is, make a decision. They have to report it to Council so Council is aware. Okay? And then if that group, you know, for any reason wants to make an appeal, they make an appeal to Council. Jim, I think the policy is if the people in City Initiative City sponsor, we have a process. Any request for the front lawn now has a designated process to create a business plan. But when you say City Initiative and City Sponsor, you are limiting so much. Why do we have to sponsor the event? Why do we have to initiate it? What does that have to do with regulating the use of the front lawn? That's my issue. How would you regulate it? Don't you want to regulate it? He just outlined it. Why does the City have to sponsor it, and why does the City have to initiate it? Well, maybe you can add the word City Initiative, Sponsor, or Partner. Or Approve. Why do we have to do that? Approve. 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 If you say approve, then it's, again, if the jazz does came, 
and they didn't want it, the city didn't initiate it. The city is not going to sponsor it. They're going to be an independent use, paying the cost that we outlined. The city did sponsor that event. Yeah. I know they did, but maybe we, we, I don't think we should. So what we're limiting ourselves, again, that gets back to subjective. And, and we didn't sponsor it or we didn't initiate it, so therefore it's no. Why can't you just say approve? See, but this is because not a it's a process. But we're we, it's not a cart. It's not like we have a big community gathering place that people can. This is the front lawn of City Hall. And we're treating it like it's a, you know, it's, it's. But you said yourself that you would allow another jazz festival. And why, why are we actually going to tell someone who is independently coming in saying, I want to do a jazz festival, but you can only do it if you allow us to be a sponsor with you. Um, here's why. That, that's, yeah, that's what yeah, you're saying. Here's, here's yeah, why. Guess yeah, who yeah, gets the lawsuit? Guess if, if something goes wrong, guess who has to answer for it? Right. But you use the Brazilian all the time. Jim, you make them pay insurance. Hotels do it every place that leads to a public venue. You make them pay insurance. So that takes the liability off of you. If they're you on the front need, line, you, you just do it on the situation. You, do you have any doubt over there? You still have responsibility because like if there's alcohol, and that's just that it's, it's extended <laughs> under the proper <laughs> rules. You can't just say, here it is. But that's why you, you can't can. charge insurance. Every public venue charges insurance. <laughs> and it's just like a park. The new thing is not parks. We allow people out there every day. We require insurance for the. For the uh, Kelvin Festival. Absolutely. Right. We do that. That's, that's a matter of six so, standard No, that's not an issue. All I'm saying is that you say initiated and sponsored only. That means that the parks and recs have to make a decision if it's a great opportunity. Say, for instance, the Humane Society wants to come back. They can't do it unless we sponsor it or unless we initiate it. Why can't they just approve it? They're self contained. Yeah, see, at that, that, that point, something like that. And it still goes through the same the same pecking order as something that we initiated. It's not taking away the process. It's taking away that thing that, well, this isn't a children's event or this isn't a family event, so we're not going to approve it. The parks and rec department. Something. They are in fact sponsoring it. They are part of it more than So when someone rents our rent our park or this pavilion. Strong. So when the when the antique show comes to the pavilion, we're sponsoring that. We sure are. No, you're ho you're, you're you're giving them the space. Do you send out flyers? Do you sell tickets? No. They come in, they they sign on the bottom line, this is our contract. And then they pay us if they need if they need something set up, they pay our staff. And there's a fee for that. We're a landlord. We're a landlord. <coughs> we don't go out promoting the event or getting sponsors for the event. We don't do that. Can I say something? Yes. Yes. So in other words, the front lawn is for rent, just like the pavilion. The front lawn which we with, with criteria, which, which we always whatever with goes there, <laughs> but which w whatever goes there, we say, oh, it's a mm. city event. People perceive it as a city event. But you suggest, Mayor, with all due respect, that the front lawn should be treated just like the pavilion. It's for rent if you have the money to rent it. With criteria that the council sets up, absolutely yes. The, you're saying that you want, we want size limit. We have said we don't want to sell alcohol on the front line. We have said that you don't want um, events that will be out of control, that it have security. You have all this criteria that you've decided. And if you can meet that criteria and you come to the city, then yes, you can rent the front line. That's what I'm saying. That creates a sense of place. Yes. And if they run it without our involvement, without our control, we're involved in the beginning. Just a minute. And, and you have gang fights or you have some incident mm -hmm. in a carnival. Again, it, it can happen or not, but it did happen. That that could be very easily done 
Someone had said it. We should, you know, if you think from now on and you cannot contain it on the front line, it can't be. You can do that. Make the criteria. Don't be afraid of it. If it's what you want, then outline it. And then we have a place here that can be used, and we will have a certain amount of expectation that it will be contained. It will have, if you're selling tickets, you only can sell so many that it will end at a certain time, there will be no alcohol, whatever the criteria is. And then we can have that front line as a source of revenue. That's I always revenue. thought the sponsorship gives us the ability to control the event. The we dictated to the, Cal to the Chaldean Festival, we dictated that they use our police, because we think that our police will control it better than private state security. And what do we base that on? Uh, on? On our capable police. The best that we can expect. Sponsorship to me allow better control of the event. I'd like to suggest that we um, postpone this discussion. Uh, we've given a lot of feedback, and maybe the city administrator could meet with uh, representatives yeah. of the police department, parks and rec, other. There are some. Uh, there are some protocols within the parks and rec board to get to some of this. Um, so I think we need to review how the if some if an organization went to the board. They function. When's the last time the organization went? You know, maybe maybe there's something here that we can build on. But the point of the matter is, what we don't want is an event that we can't control. Yeah. And well, that I think it we comes with negative yeah. implications. We, we all agree on whatever that might but be. I, think, I think this takes more work and more staff time, and, and maybe legals involved as well, um, because we're spinning wheels here. Because you have to meet with consensus. Can I say something? Everybody else, everybody else chimed in. I've been watching. Everybody else chimed in without raising their hands, and no. they didn't get. <laughs> and they didn't get the chest out. You're on the list. We ought to be standing on the deck looking for icebergs. And as usual, we're down in the engine room repairing an engine. This, this is a, I see this as a two-part thing. I don't see anything drastically wrong with this except a couple of wordsmiths about uh, partnership or sponsorship or, or whatever it is. The details of how it works ought to be referred to another group to put those details together. The size, the makeup, the, all of that, so that we do have a document that everyone understands that they can uh, deal with a person that, or a group that comes to the city. The way this is written, it sounds like we're the source of knowledge for everything that ought to go on the front lawn. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people in the world that have great ideas and they may knock on our door that with events that we hadn't even considered mm -hmm. that would be the right thing to do on our front lawn. Mm -hmm. But we're limiting ourselves by narrowing it down to we got to think of it. Um, so I think the, the debate tonight was productive because it, it brought some things to the surface that I think would never have been brought but I don't think this is the table where we do the details. It's at some other. It's in some other. There's another committee that needs to put the details of how well, how we actually do this. You that. You that. Yeah, I know, but I've been waiting for my turn, so I didn't yell that.
So we can direct the mayor to sign the letter that uh, to support it to Dave Coulter to include it. Could we see the letter? Pardon? Yeah, it's in here. Oh, that you just want to This is the letter. That's, oh, I see. that's the letter I that was drafted.
I, I don't know, John, but that's, that's not my point. Who owns it? My point is, I think it would be helpful for us to have current data on what is the revenue per square foot, as opposed, uh, at, in, in comparison to other uh, like-sized malls or aging malls. Mm -hmm. Not like a Somerset um, or Great Lakes Crossing, but uh, a similar... Do you think they're going to have that? Oh, absolutely they have it. Absolutely, uh, they have that kind of information. Uh, and the, the retail mix. You know, we have concerns about the retail mix. There, a lot of it is boutique, mom pop. Um, I, 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 I didn't ask about listing, Joan. You're not understanding me. We need data for us to form opinions or, or to make suggestions. I think we need some data from Northland. It's just easy to say, uh, you know, I don't like that bus stop or um, I don't like the retail mix there, but we need data. Um, and, and we don't have really any data. We have opinions. So I, you know, I, I don't know that we can force Northland, but when Larry Rupert was there, he provided us with data. I'm not trying, I just know that they don't care. Well, then, what's the strength? Well, that's, you're absolutely right. They don't care. Um, uh, Mr. City Administrator, are they appealing their taxes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's data. Yeah, that's key data. Yeah. Well, we'll find out where it is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, another, uh, another piece of data would, that would be helpful is what is the percentage of the mall that is uh, currently leased? <coughs> and understand and find out what's going on with the J.C. Penney, which the mall doesn't own. Uh, I, I heard that J.C. Penney was going to get out of that or was selling it or something. It's sold. It's sold. It's sold. Yeah. It's a new yeah. It's a person. Yeah. 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 So that's the kind of data we need really to be talking about this mall. Um, and when you're talking about revenue, understand Target and Macy's yeah. have two separate stores. Mm -hmm. They're not part of the mall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not part of the mall. They're not part of the mall. Never has been. They're independent. Yeah. Yeah. Never has been. Well, they own their own buildings. Yes, yeah, they do. That they're on. No, they're independent. Mm -hmm. They're independent. Like that? I know they cut some flaws and all the things. They're doing very well over yeah. there. This, this footprint is too large. They cannot. Yeah. That's just not their model anymore. Too many square footage. Yeah, they're doing 100,000 square footage. Way too much parking. Okay, we're going to move on to some questions. Mr. Bunker? Good evening, my name is Brett Bunker, 24201 Garner, uh, directly adjacent to 24185 Garner, which is the property that subsequently has been sold recently. And the idea that they were going to adopt a policy whereby the property would be so flat gold is kind of troubling to me. The property is covered with a uh, Asian species of invasive vine, a noxious weed. We have an ordinance against, and if I'm not mistaken, we publish yearly indications that people who own residential property are desired to control the noxious weeds. This concept of letting two acres go, as I say, that's already got vines that are three and four inches in diameter. These vines began growing behind Aerosmith after they bought the adjacent property, recently approved for tax abatement, as has been Maxitrol. Prior to the vote, 
prior to Lear's purchase of residential property, the council voted as to whether or not to let them, as a recent tax abatement in 2003, purchase the 100 acres that subsequently in 2006 was approved for the $13 million brownfield tax grant. I'm kind of confused why we voted. I thought we kind of set a precedent to avoid what happened, as Mr. Frazier remembers, but with Aerosmith, when their tax abatement turned into a $9 million debt, and the three acres that sits there today, harboring and harvesting noxious weeds for the seeds to all blow onto our residential, aside from the north side, which is completely paved over. I don't think they can let that property go in all good faith and represent support of wildlife. I found the first yearling to be four to six, seven months old with a broken leg, tangled up, trying to follow the elders into this now fenced area. So it didn't do much to help that deer, but my dog is loving the butchered efforts to turn it into a usable, if not heartbreaking, demonstration of what this fence has already done. But additionally, I'm encouraged by here we're talking about a hard and fast policy that Mr. Fricasse made us aware, the tax abatement policy, a hard and fast policy that lost all control. No guidelines were ever being used. The fact that the city assessor's job was to pre-approve before any consideration tax abatements was totally lost in the past 20 years I've lived here. So a policy that entitles the use of the taxpayer-owned front lawn could accompany with a $5 donation. I've been a lot of places in this country. I've been to Royal Oak, I've been downtown, and I see the venues they offer. Three different stages, you know, you can go, you could have one over near the golf course, one back by the wood chips, one on the front lawn, and line the sidewalk areas with vendors. I see that as a simple and extremely necessary. We've got the location, we keep talking about it. People don't have to drive downtown, they don't have to drive to Ann Arbor, Royal Oak, 96 comes here, Telegraph, Southfield, everything comes here, and what better way to enjoy an afternoon than in the sunshine or the pouring rain, should it happen to be that way, with five bucks. It's cheaper than a gallon, not quite, but you know, the gas you save by coming near your home and supporting the city in a way that I think the mayor has very eloquently <coughs> stated. We need to be a cultural center with diversity of ethnic, you know, groups of people that have all kinds of different tastes that I'd like to experience, even though I've never been to a whatever, Chaldean, I don't mean to point out a particular race, but yes, I think everything that opens a venue of more communicative, more belief in their music culture, their dance, the artwork, their mobile art kinds of things we could stage out here. Let the students, Northwest, I mean, Lawrence Tech, it would be a marvelous. I'd like to see them get into this economic, financial, solar slash wind turbine and design some really efficient houses. I mean, go over the top and use the brains of these kids. I appreciate your time, and again, it's well worth it to appear, and I love America. We love you, America. I wanted to acknowledge my friend that was here, Sixth Circuit Court Judge Leo Bowman, but he had to leave. My name is Pamela Gerald. I am an independent voice for Southfield. If you are listening to my voice via YouTube or audio reproduction, I can be reached at P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan, 48037-0155, or by telephone at 248-352-9188. And Councilman Moss, this is for you. I would like to share a positive story. 
with you regarding a 50-year lifelong resident of Southfield. Her name is Ms. Kathy McHugh. Ms. McHugh has some very valid concerns regarding a property in the John Grace area that is owned by the city of Southfield. No cell phones, please. This property has had some very serious code enforcement issues that did not represent the Southfield standards that our esteemed Mayor Brenda Lawrence and Mr. Southfield, Councilman Donald Fercasi, often refers to. In order to establish and maintain this standard, we need every resident to have their eyes on Southfield because we're doing more with less. The code enforcement concerns were as follows. Number one, debris on both the tennis court and the roller hockey area. This included noxious weeds growing up through the cracks in the concrete. Please shut your cell phone off. Number two, four trees that needed to be removed along with the two tree stumps that were not removed previously. Number three, as a result of the expanded tree roots, the eight slabs along the sidewalk were damaged, unfit for walking and a potential hazard because the sidewalks were pushed upward. And finally, number four, most of the area uh, around there <coughs> was enclosed with the fence, the fence was damaged. I know this is not something that our mayor or Mr. Southfield, Donald Fracassi, could or would be proud of. With the team effort of our city administration and the talented, loyal, and dedicated staff members, Mrs. McHugh's problems are currently being resolved. Mr. Gerald Witkowski was the first to be contacted. In an expeditious and collective manner, he got with Mrs. Maria Calhoun and Miss Tina and started the ball rolling. Code enforcement then contacted Mr. Leo Clower, director of our forestry department. Mr. Clower did an, assess uh, an assessment to determine that the trees needed to be removed. Then the sidewalks could be repaired and then the fence could be restored. What really impressed me about our team, our city team, was the fact that our assistant city administrator, Mr. Fred Zorn, went out there personally to revisit and look at that area, and he assured the residents in that area that Southfield is concerned about the quality of life and the neighborhood surrounding for the people in that area. So I want to thank my city and the staff members, Parks and Recreation, Facilities and Maintenance, Corey Rosen, Mr. Justin in the Road Department for making Mrs. McHugh a 50-year lifelong resident life a little bit better and making her more happy. Now you can see with collective team effort and residents having their eyes on Southfield that we can really work together in this city. This is how Southfield should be governed with cooperation, with respect and civility for all of us. Madam President, my name is Gerard Mullen. Since 1968, I have lived at 17880 Louis Street. And since 1961, I have worked here in this city, my city, the great city of Southfield. Tonight, I'm here right now to tell you folks about one of this city's great employees, Marie Kowalski, <laughs> the tree lady from South, of Southfield. This evening, I would like to publicly thank Marie for saving my four precious, tall, and beautiful ash trees. Yes, you heard me right, ash trees. Otherwise, my front yard would be laid barren today, just like tens of thousands of other yards scattered throughout southeastern Michigan, left ravaged by that voracious predator, the Emerald Ash Boar. Folks, let's turn the clock back to June 2005, 
at a time when the only thing I knew about trees was that I had four boar infested ashes, one of which I believed at that time, 2005, to be dead. Today I refer to that dead tree as Lazarus. When I called the city of South Hill to see if I needed a permit to dispose of Lazarus, Maureen told me no. And she sent me a list of 27 tree service contractors. Plus, and this is, this is crucial, the phone number of Michigan State University, MSU, Extension Service. MSU's Mary Ann, to my great relief and to my great surprise, told me that my ashes could be saved. And she sent me a packet chock full of information. And I got out. Within a week, I had performed all the easy homeowner steps. I even treated Lazarus. I also learned from this MSU packet that this deadly double, the Ever Ash Borer, was first spotted in this area in July 2002. The following May, that is 2003, a crescendo of chainsaws could be heard throughout my subdivision of Pheasant Hunt. Shortly afterwards, in the month of June, my next door neighbor's ash was cut down. Her tree had been kissing Lazarus. <laughs> resulting, in I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I make the calendars, but that's uh, <laughs> 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 well, the <laughs> <laughs> Her tree had been kissing Lazarus, resulting in Lazarus and his three brothers becoming infected. In fact, every ash and peasant run was infested, and soon the city swarmed through and cut down every ash in the right of way. Overnight, Southfield had become an epicenter for an epidemic for which there appeared then, at that time, to be no magic bullet. <laughs> Today, there are only seven known surviving ashes currently residing here, right here in Tree City, USA. And I have four, Lazarus and his three brothers. I'm four for four, not four for five. I'm batting a thousand in a ballpark where the average player is batting close to zero. Bill. All thanks to Maureen Kowalski, the tree lady of Southfield. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. And a special thank you to MSU and a big thank you to Noreen. Thank you very much. I have some pictures. Um, this way goes to you, Terry. Um, we have those beautiful um, shelters now in the South the City, the buses. Um, I was driving through Birmingham and I saw that they had staff that was squeezing the, the shelter, that glass part to keep it clean. I want to know what is our, our process so that they do not become a high for
on our summer people, the, the people work with the Jerry Wachowski, mm -hmm. and uh, have contact you. I, I, I think part part of it is the design of the shelters are beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. But they come with these undersized trash receptacles mm -hmm. that are part of SMART's you know, mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And in the highly trafficked areas, such as down the street in front mm -hmm. of the shops, you can see people's attempts to try to get the garbage in there, they're, they're piling it. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't take long for it to fill up, and once a month is not, yeah. not been doing it. I personally have called several times, and uh, that is just one of the one of a few that we haven't been able to um, get a gentleman's agreement from the adjacent property owner at that time. And since there's been some recent um, shelters and, and trash receptacles installed, um, we're working on a plan and having them all mapped so that we, the city, has a backup plan. That has been an issue, and it's something that we're working on to try to address. They're beautiful, by the way. They are beautiful, but I tell you, when you start getting that glass um, fingerprint and muddy up, mm -hmm. they're not as attractive. And I is it glass or is it plastic? It's glass, glass it to the glass. chair. And all I can say is they have been very responsive when we have called them about getting their crews out here. And, and my, my question is, um, My question is, can we hire, like we hire <coughs> the, the teens or college students at a, a casual rate or whatever it is, to or seniors, it doesn't have to be a college student, that would, that would be their job to um, to clean those. I, I don't know. I, to me, I, I was so impressed when I went to Birmingham and saw them squeezing and cleaning it and just having that high standard on something that's such a public use. It says something about your city, and I would like to know, even if it's, because um, there's a man that's on uh, Lincoln Road. He, he stopped me and told me that he literally comes out every morning and cleans that area, and picks up the trash. And he just wanted the city, if he picks it up, to come pick it up and take it away. Uh, could he put a trash receptacle or something? Because he's so committed and <coughs> to keeping that area clean. It's, you know, we don't do enough with people wanting to volunteer to help us with the city. And, um, you know, we can ask for people who's riding the bus that you would see. Because we had a person, before we got those trash receptacles on 12 Mile and Evergreen, who literally every morning brought a garbage bag. And people would put their trash in and then she would take it home in the evening. That's how committed she was because mm -hmm. people were throwing trash and there was no receptacle. So people, you know, we're not the only ones that want our city to look good. So I think, you know, we can we can really work. We'll see what we can do to have yeah. a protocol. Yeah. That's, that's what we need. We need a system. And I can tell you, those bus shelters at Northland are awesome. Oh, yeah. They, they look like they've never been clean. They are awesome. Well, they're going to get a little attention, too. Well, I have something to say. I have some news for everybody. You know where I live in Albany Hood? Well, my hallway, which is cleaned by the company every other day, is full of garbage. People bring the garbage out from their apartments and put it by the front door inside the hallway garbage it stinks. I didn't call the owners today because I figured somebody is going to pick it up and get rid of it. And I left the house tonight. There it is. So when I come home tonight, that's where it is. Again, that's the second time people putting garbage in the hallway. What do you do? Do you have a trash room? Do you have a trash room? Usually in apartment oh, complexes. Oh, you don't have. They used to. Yeah. 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 Yeah.